ज्ञानाजनशलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मलित तस्म श्रीगुरव नम ओं विष्णुपादाय कृष्णपेष्टा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पश्चातिदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत कदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण It's a basic question for everybody who have here asked about this kind of question. The thing is, a lot of times we get inspiration to get up early in the morning, chant in the good house in the morning, mm. do some proper shasanas every day, the right prescribed uh, mm. timing, all the things. But even though we get the inspiration, but the inspiration does not last for some time. Mm. So maybe for a couple of weeks again, we still hear so many philosophies and everything. But the inspiration which doesn't get to your heart, it just stops at a mm. certain point, and then we feel like, okay, this is what we cannot do with those kind of things. Our mind will, you know, impulse. Yeah. This is what the way we have, we can live yes. in our situation. Like that. What is the way to keep up with inspiration going on continuously? Mm-hmm. Like uh, so many, yeah, like so Maharaj, so many people. Are there. Yeah, so we hear classes, we get inspired. Yeah. But the inspiration doesn't last. There are two things here. Firstly, see, even if the the inspiration doesn't last, the purification that we get when we act with inspiration that lasts. So, if I decide to do some sadhana enthusiastically for maybe it lasts for one week, ten days, fifteen days, that is going to last. So, in that sense, uh, in spiritual life, we have to see success. More as a direction than a destination. It's like a relationship. It's never a destination. Even when we go back to the spiritual world, what are we going to do? We're going to serve Krishna. That's going to go on. So it's more of a direction. And sometimes we move the direction faster. Sometimes we may not move that fast. So if we think that okay, coming to this standard is success. No, that standard is a way we are expressing our intense devotion to Krishna. Uh, so even if we go in the, it's like I'm moving in the direction of Krishna, and some days when I'm inspired, I take pick up speed and move faster. And sometimes when I'm not that inspired, I may move slowly. So first of all, the nature of the mind is that it will find reason to be discouraged even when we are encouraged. So that means we hear some class and we get inspired. Now I can do it, but then the mind says, hey, you know, you're not going to continue it anymore. So why do it only? It's like that. So we don't have to fall for that trick of the mind. That okay, even if I will to continue it for one week, for ten days, one month, whatever it is, I'll get purified during that time. And in general, when we become inspired, also, it is better to make positive resolutions than negative resolutions. Because I will never do this. It's a. You know, it said that don't make resolutions that a dead person can keep better than you. <laughs> <laughs> If I say, okay, I'm never going to overeat. Well, a dead person is never going to overeat. You know? <laughs> so negative resolutions are not very positively inspiring. So if we focus, okay, okay, I tend to overeat, and I, I don't want to do that. But I will fill my time and my day and my mind with something more positive. And when I keep doing that, so um, then that will enable me to resist that. So if I so in general, it's best to make positive resolutions, and then if if I, if I decide okay, I'm going to chant some extra rounds, or I'm going to recite some verses, I'm going to memorize something. So then, even if we are not able to maintain that negative resolution, it doesn't matter because the positive resolution has connected us with Krishna to that extent. So it's, we see success as a direction rather than destination, and we focus on the positive resolution to move along in that direction. And secondly, it's uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita says that hearing about Krishna is like food for the soul. It's food for bhakti. So we have to uh, keep 
seeking food regularly. We never say that, no, I ate food yesterday. I don't have energy today. So why should I eat today again? <coughs> no, we eat again. So similarly, we uh, we have what you could say um, a willpower and a willpower level. So that means we okay. This is say uh, you could say okay. I can fast on Ekadashi by taking. I can fast till noon. And after that, I'll take some fruits or I'll take one meal. That's the level I can do. If I'm very inspired or it's a special day which comes once a year or a few times a year, I may say I will fast till evening. So say this is so this is say fasting till noon is my average level willpower level. Now I can go beyond that on a few occasions. Sometimes I fall below that also. So what will happen by the steady practice of bhakti is that it's not specifically in terms of austerity, because as we grow old, austerity may become more difficult also. But I'm just giving that as an example that the average willpower level will increase because we'll connect with Krishna more and more. So it's not so much that uh, uh, specific activities we have to quantify the willpower in those terms. But um, Bhakti Sanjara could give the example that once his disciple was very sick, not able to digest anything. So he told him to take ghee. When you take ghee, everything, all the ghee was vomited out. This came out. But he said, take, keep taking ghee. Even if you throw it out, still some ghee will stay inside. And that ghee will strengthen you. And eventually he got healed. That way. That's not the only way to heal digestive problems. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an example that somehow, so even if we feel we hear and not much stays, but still, while we hear, for the short while after that, at least the purification remains, the inspiration remains, the conviction remains. And then we move on. That, that time we move faster. So even if inspiration is not there, we continue on with our conviction, with our commitment, and we keep seeking inspiration when it comes. But we don't have to uh, lose the, uh, not intensify our practice just because the inspiration is not going to stay. Does that answer your question? I have an extension of the question, yeah. Prabhu. Please. So, uh, always mind, mind takes always the least resistance path, right? So, uh, whenever we have an uh, association going on, a devotional association going on, and uh, even in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has said that uh, uh, your dharma, you have to fulfill your dharma, right? Mm -hmm. So, we have our uh, uh, family issues that everything has to be taken care of. Uh, mm -hmm. And this association goes into the num priority number two. So, how can we... Uh, like, okay, yeah. So sometimes if I have family of professional responsibilities, because association goes to a lower priority, there, are, uh, there is a purpose and there is a priority. Our purpose is to move towards Krishna, but specifically at different times, different things may be more important. It's just like, say, if you have to go to a temple now, from here, if the traffic is very heavy, we'll go slowly. If the road traffic clears, we'll go fast. But similarly, we want to move towards Krishna. And sometimes the traffic of our uh, material activities becomes a lot. If somebody falls sick in the family, if there is a deadline in the project, then at that time, our uh, spiritual activities will become a little slower. But after they clear up, then we can intensify. Or sometimes you may decide that, oh, this is a time when we can go for a yatra, or there's some devotee association specially available, and I can spend more time on this time. So that time we may accelerate further, and we may put uh, the... Uh, material activities on the back burner a little bit, but that adjustment is fine. So in general, balance. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing to, if you want to balance, you know, the first thing to understand about balance is that we can never find any ideal balance. We live in a real world, <laughs> so ba balance itself has to be dynamic. So if I'm if I'm riding a cycle, I want to go in this direction, but I find that there's a wall over it. Then I have to tilt myself and then move right. And then again tilt myself left and then move on straight. So similarly, sometimes in our life, we have a direction to move towards, but sometimes we have to balance, bend this way, sometimes bend that way. So it's more of a dynamic balance rather than a static balance. It's a, see, as long as the purpose is clear in life, sometimes priorities may have to be adjusted according to time, place, circumstances. That is perfectly okay. So the key is, it's not that after the traffic clears, still I keep going slowly. Then that means I'm not interested in going to the temple only. <laughs> so 
we have to be honest that uh, that when the other things are not that important we have to move towards krishna and over a period of time by this living we learn balance okay this is what here i overdid this thing. and later on i feel no here i could have done this more but i missed that opportunity so we look back and we learn also say so if i had, i could have turned this much i could have turned only this much i could have gone this way and could have gone forward also so krishna also says yukta har we are to be regulated in everything so there is no need to worry if circumstantially certain things become more important than devotion now there is a subtle point over here also when i said the traffic is become tight then we can't move towards uh, uh, wherever we're going in bhakti even our worldly activities even our family responsibilities our professional responsibilities they are also a part of our devotion so in that sense they are we could say that indirect devotion this is direct devotion but uh, we need to separate the two so that we give some uh, some quality time for direct devotion but in the actual living we don't have to constantly separate you know, this is this is material this is spiritual ultimately what defines a thing as material or as spiritual is the attitude if i am doing my worldly responsibility also in a mood of service to krishna then that is spiritual also we don't have to constantly oh i'm not giving you know oh, i take so much of my time is being taken by material things if we have to do it just do it wholeheartedly otherwise the mind is such a thing that we may think actually my lamentation is spiritual you know i'm doing this material responsibility but i'm so attached to krishna i want to be so attached to krishna i'm think i'm not able to do bhakti but the mind is so deceptive that when we are doing bhakti the mind will say hey what are you doing here? you have so many responsibilities why are you not doing that so the mind if we just listen to the mind the mind will not let us do material things properly not let us do spiritual things also properly so when you are doing material things hey, come on do spiritual <coughs> uh, if you do spiritual say do material yes. what do you want i want to keep you miserable <laughs> 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 so when we are doing something just do it wholeheartedly and in experience we can learn whether they should be done more whether they should be done less so if we see that integrated vision that everything is a service to krishna some is direct some is indirect then we can move forward much more positively the leela amrutha is described that when shri prabhupad was in prayag at that time he or he had he had a chemist you know he used to dispense medicines and there was a uh, there was a doctor with whom you would say the doctor would prescribe and prabhupada give the medicine so that doctor writes it's it's kind of lila the doctor says that uh, it was clear that he was abhay babu at that time he was not bhakti ran swami or prabhupada says abhay babu was a very deeply religious man that is clear but at that time his main concern was how can i earn more money so that was the situation was the life he had to do that so if that was what was required prabhupada did it so similarly uh we try to do our best in the situation that we are in and uh, krishna ultimately knows our situation krishna understands krishna is not a judgmental god oh, you did not do this you did not do that krishna is understanding god if we try to if we have a desire to serve krishna and circumstantially we are not able to do it no bhakti is very subtle sometimes i may go to the temple and in the temple i am simply looking who has not come so much will attached <laughs> this person fallen this person is on the way to fall down now <laughs> somebody else may not be able to come to the temple but their heart is in the temple and they by their longing to be in the temple they may make more spiritual advancement so it's in bhakti the external actions are important but the internal attitude is equally if not more important so if we have that desire strong desire to serve krishna then even when circumstantially we are not able to do we do the responsibility wholeheartedly whatever is required but at the same time we keep that longing for krishna we will make advancement even through that okay the questions so one more extension to that okay <laughs> so devotional service is something like something that we have to perform joyfully right so that's what uh, it actually say okay. right and uh, most of the time like the, the places where i stay then people wear like uh, sabari when mala or they take dicha and they say okay i'm following this path so what happens generally is okay hey to, from tomorrow i'm going to uh, start this dicha so i will leave whatever i want today 
and I want to go to a movie. I have to come here today, and from tomorrow I'll start it. So basically, what they're they are feeling is, uh, okay, this is my uh, days of enjoyment, and now I'm taking a diksha, so uh, I can't do all these things. So let me enjoy now, and then I'll take diksha. Okay. So now, like, how how does this uh, 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 joyfulness yeah. uh, performing the uh, uh, devotional service? How does that work? Okay. So, it said the devotional service has to be performed joyfully, but sometimes we think of enjoyable activity as something separate. And say before initiation, we have a binge and we enjoy as much as we want. And then now afterward, I won't be able to do this. Yeah. There are two things over here. You know, there's in Shri Bhagavatam 1 to 22, it is said that Atavai Kavayo Nityam Bhaktim Paramaya Muda Vasudeve Bhagwati Kurvantyatma Prasadinim. So Atavai Kavayo Nityam. Therefore, the wise people constantly. Bhaktim Paramaya Muda. They perform Bhakti with great joy. Vasudeve Bhagavati. And to Lord Vasudev, who is Bhagavan. Kurvante Atma Prasadinim. This Bhakti is what brings joy to the heart. So if we reduce it down to the essence, what he's saying is the wise perf joyfully perform the Bhakti that brings joy. So is joy a component of devotion or is it a consequence of devotion? Put another way, you say chant Hare Krishna and be happy, Shri Prabhupada said. Is this one instruction or two instructions? <laughs> <laughs> is the chanting Hare Krishna will lead to happiness or chant Hare Krishna? That's one instruction, be happy. That's another instruction. <laughs> so actually it is both ways. That means that the Suppose somebody has been sick for a long time. They tried various treatments, nothing worked. And then eventually they find a medicine that works. So now they're not yet healthy. But they're happy that I have found a medicine that works. And as they keep taking that medicine, they will become happier. So similarly, for us, chanting will some chanting and practice of bhakti will sometimes bring happiness. Sometimes they don't bring happiness. But we understand that this is going to purify me and that purified state will lead to lasting happiness. So for that, I'm grateful. And in that sense, sometimes chant and be happy will be a causal statement. I chant and I feel happy. Sometimes when that doesn't happen, then I chant and I cultivate happiness as a disposition because I at least am grateful I have the opportunity to practice bhakti. So, some, so sometimes in the conditioned stage, when the modes of passion and ignorance become strong, at that time, we are not able to perceive the joyfulness of bhakti. So that time it may appear that, okay, this is enjoyable and okay, this is my enjoyment and this is my duty. So, okay, and so I feel, okay, I have to give up my enjoyment and do this duty. It may appear like that. So sometimes it appears as if, say, if there is some, you know, there is some carob halwa and there is some carrot and celery. So, <laughs> so we will feel okay, material life is all the enjoyment like carob halwa and our bhakti is like carrot and celery. So that will be the perception as long as we are in the modes of passion and ignorance. So that time we have to do bhakti as an austerity. Still, I'll take this. But actually, as we start practicing bhakti, as we start becoming purified, we we'll start realizing that bhakti is actually like the carob halwa. Because, yes, there is some pleasure in sense enjoyment, but that pleasure is so temporary, it's so superficial. But that we cannot realize as long as we are dominated by the modes of passion. And actually, you will see that we ourselves go through different modes at different times. So sometimes in the mode of, we are in the mode of goodness, we feel Bhakti is so nice. I just want this to go on and on. I want to do this. Why do I do anything else? And then later go into the mode of passion and ignorance, you say, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so we oscillate through the modes. That's why we, when we say take initiation, there's a commitment. That no matter how I feel, I'll continue doing this. But in general, by the practice of bhakti, as we come to the mode of goodness, we start appreciating uh, purer pleasures more and more. So initially, it will appear as if this lower taste is better and the higher taste is not so good. But if we become purified, 
then we will see actually the higher taste is better. So till that time there is some austerity. So we we cannot uh, at one level we can say that uh, joyfulness is a result of bhakti. It's a consequence of bhakti. But we can also see joyfulness as a component of bhakti. That means if I if I use my intelligence to count my blessings, you know, to remember what all the things that are right in my life, uh, then I can cultivate happiness. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita, 17th chapter, Krishna says, satisfaction is an austerity of the mind. In 17.16, he says, Manah prasada saumyatva mauna matma vinigra bhava samshuddhi tiyetat tapo mana samuchyate. So manah prasada is satisfaction. So in general, we think of satisfaction as an emotion. I feel satisfied, I don't feel satisfied. That's true. But satisfaction is also a decision which we make. And how do we make that decision? So if I look at the things which I have, I can cultivate satisfaction. Or if I look at the things that are right in my life, I can cultivate satisfaction. If I look at the things which I don't have or the things that are wrong in my life, then that will lead to dissatisfaction. So in that sense, what will I focus my vision on? That is a decision I can make. So when the mind by default starts looking at all the things we don't have, the intelligence needs to look at the things we have. When we do that, then even in our situation, we will feel satisfied. So both materially we can be satisfied, spiritually also we can be satisfied in the sense that we are grateful that we have the opportunity for spiritual growth. So by making that conscious decision to count our blessings, to look at the things that are right in our life, we can bring bhakti, uh, bring satisfaction or joy as a component in our devotion. And then when joy is a component of our devotion, then that connection with Krishna becomes deeper. Krishna says, Teshaam Stadyuktanam Bhajatam Priti Purvakam. When we do that, we perform with affection, then Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayanti. Krishna gives us the intelligence of how to come closer to Him, how to, how to see more and more of the blessings, and how to become joyful. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. So, Prabhu, I have multiple questions for this one topic. Um, sorry, if I guess I'm not sure. Like, um, but, uh, so you see, man, if any of the Matajis want to ask, and if you want to write in chits and give, that's also fine. <laughs> 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 I was in Perth. So, we had a three day only question answer session. So, first day, all Prabhus were asking questions. So, next day, the Matajis said that they felt a little hesitant to ask publicly. So, what we did was, we put a prashna patra, <laughs> <laughs> a bowl with questions, <laughs> and then next day we had almost like hundred questions there. <laughs> yeah. So, Prabhu, my question is uh, on the topic of financial responsibility for you. Mm -hmm. Um. So, in my first question, it is uh, mentioned how low well the income is to be distributed, you know, fifty percent in temple, twenty five to seventeen twenty five per hour. Uh, in this age and the, how practical it is and at what point a devotee, think, devotee should think that it is time to do that. Because other things also in the administration people try to practice that you know, for three or four verses that is everybody practically, it is possible. But this part, um, how to distribute your income, with, how to make it in such a way that it is directed to education. First, secondly, um, due to the surroundings and other environment and other family responsibilities, our mind or at least someone's mind is always going in that way. You know, I have to earn so that I can go to the family. I have to earn so I can fulfill the responsibility. So, is it even like a good thing because you have your responsibilities, which sometimes can only be fulfilled by providing the financial support? Yeah. Thirdly. Um, sometimes you are very like lenient with yourself that if I if I already have a phone and I'm like I I know that I cannot afford a new phone but I still want to buy a new phone I still do it anyway and if like that there are so many other things that we spend money for ourselves and we don't feel guilty but when it comes to other person like anyone, spouse or family or anything, we say, no, it's not like this, uh, it's not money, let's spend some money. <laughs> okay. You know, that, <laughs> okay. At that point, we feel busy, you know, that we are spending our money in the wrong way, so. Mm. Okay. So I would say, let's 
so first question is that we always feel that we have a responsibility to provide financial security and that requires earning more and more uh, but at the same time we are also told that we should give charity and then giving say the recommended percentage of charity is it practical in this age so there is a principle and there is a practice I was talking with one devotee uh, he is uh, he's one of the leaders of his coin in terms of financial management so he was telling that the you know, Prabhupada has told 50% but most devotees don't even give 5% mm -hmm. so what happens is that well, now what that 50% means there are different devotees who have different ideas some devotees say it's 50% of income some devotees say it means 50% of what remains with what the difference between your income and your expense from that you give 50% but uh, there are now uh, I wouldn't go into the specifics of that because the, we have to understand the principle. The principle is that uh, charity is not just action, it's an attitude. It is not just activity, it's a mentality. That means that whenever we earn something, if we understand that whatever I was able to earn, I was able to earn by Krishna's mercy. It is the ability to earn that is given by Krishna. The arrangement by which I can earn it, that is also given by Krishna. So therefore, I should give something. So sometimes we feel, you know, oh, I want to give that 50%. But what devotee was telling me that, you know, every day I pray to Krishna, Krishna, I want to earn so much that I'll be able to give not 50, but 51%. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that, I was talking to him, he said that he has been praying like this for the last 15 years and he has not given much. <laughs> so what happens is that even if we say succeed in earning a lot, uh, the nature of the mind is that the more we earn, the more it craves. And uh, unless we have cultivated a habit of giving, even when we have a lot, the mind will come, oh, you need to arrange for this also, you have to arrange for this also. Generally, as we earn more, our, uh, you could say, uh, standard of living goes up and then the expenses also go up. So in general, if we postpone charity to a future, when we will have greater financial security or greater earnings, then that will never happen. So it's best, okay, right now in whatever situation I am in, I'll give some charity. And what percentage it should be, that is something which uh, is, uh, is something which we we'll have to individually decide based on our situation and our future planning, our needs. So basically what we can at least do is make it a habit to give some amount on a regular basis. Once we do that, that becomes a habit. And that habit will keep us moving. And if, say, if we are in financial difficulty, we make you less. If we have a little more, we make you more. But it is, it is a part of our, uh, you could say, it, it should become a part, ingrained part of our habit, of our mind. That is a habit which I have cultivated. So, now with respect to, <clears throat> say uh, financial security or say how much we, how much security we arrange. Uh, there are, it's, uh, I gave a series of classes in Denver on this topic of, uh, you know, what is our quota? Then we talk about Tena Tena Bhunjita Maguda Pasadit Sudhanam. Ishopanishad says that we should all not encroach upon others' side, we just take our quota. So one simple way to understand the quota is that, that it's like food. Now how much food does who needs? Now, some people may eat two chapatis, some people may eat six chapatis. Some people may eat uh, this much rice, some people may eat that much rice. Now, the test is not, now somebody may be eating a lot, that doesn't mean that they are attached to food. Somebody may be eating a less, that doesn't mean that they are attached from food. It is what is the need? So, how do I know in terms of food what, what is my need? So, basically, food should not become a competitor to Krishna. <laughs> what that means is, if I eat too little, if I say Ekadashi, I'm going to fast Nirjan, and I'm going to chant 128 rounds, and I'm sitting and chanting, Hare Krishna, and my mind is saying, food, 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 Prasad, Hare Krishna, Prasad, Prasad, Hare Krishna, Prasad, Prasad. <laughs> that sort of chanting is out of much use. So better take some food, come back and chant. So if the food I am taking is too little, 
then the, the mind becomes so obsessed with food that it becomes a competitor. The food becomes a competitive question. Similarly, if I eat too much, then either I feel sleepy after eating or if I keep eating too much, then the craving becomes disproportionate. It becomes excessive. Constantly, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. So if there is too little or too much, in both cases, the mind get, gets too entangled in it. Mm -hmm. But when we eat the right quantity, then okay, we feel it's, we can never be materially fully satisfied. But at least that agitation because of too less or too much is not there. So this balance of how much food we should eat, we all learn by experience. Sometimes you may do more, sometimes you may do less. The same we could apply to finances. Now, we all have a, uh, we all have a need for security. And even in the family, there may be different family members who may have different levels of need for security. Just like some people need to eat more, some people need to eat less. So we have to find out a level of a level of security where money doesn't become a competitor to Krishna. If I'm not having a job itself, I'm I'm in constant. If I don't know where my how I'm going to pay my next installment or whatever, then at that that time it's an urgent situation where I have to look for a job. So and I have to make some arrangements. So if there is too much uncertainty about the money, then money just dominates our consciousness. And then in that case, money becomes a competitor to Krishna. But suppose we get into the mood that you know, I just want to earn more and more and more. Then also the craving becomes unlimited. So if I decide that okay, these many hours I'm going to work, or these many hours I'm going to give to Krishna. And apart from that, in whatever hours I work, if I can, whatever I can earn, I'll be okay with that. So it can be in terms of time, in terms can be in terms of quantity of um, money that we earn. It can be in terms of the extent of the tension that we can take up in the workload. Basically, uh, a balance means that we are relatively mentally peaceful. In the material world, we can never be fully peaceful. But it's like if I have to lift weights, if my capacity is to lift 10 kg. And, and if I lift 2 kg, I'll not, there'll be no workout at all. I'll just, I'll go out and come back and do a workout <laughs> if I go for a gym also. But if I start lifting 25 kg, then I'll get crushed. So we all have to understand what is our capacity. And if I'm lifting 25 kg, I can, my muscles will pain too much. I may get into accident. But sometimes when we, when our workload becomes too excessive or when we become too obsessed about money, then we become extremely irritable about everything else. We become dismissive about anything and everybody else. So we can see it coming out in our attitude. So we have to, uh, the key to finding a balance is that, that money stops being a competitor to Krishna. Money is needed in life and we work to get it. And with experience, we learn how much quantity or how much time to spend or kind of work to do. So <clears throat> with respect to judging others, we have to find out everybody has, as I said, their own, uh, we could say, we cannot objectively say how, what is the need of whom? Because, you know, how, how can I say, no, you should eat two chapatis. Well, who are you to tell me that? <laughs> I feel hungry after that. So each one of us has to decide. So of course you can say if somebody is taking 25 chapatis. You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> that is a bit too much, isn't it? So, because somebody can be Bhima, like Bhima and they can do that also, but they are exceptions. But the point is that uh, what may be felt as a need for me may be different from what may be felt as a need for someone else. So some people, they, they get a sense of self-worth by spending, buying. And if they buy new things, they feel, oh, you know, I've got something, I've got some money, I've got some new things, I'm showing it in my house. Some people say, you know, when they, they, have a, they save the money. They get a sense of, you know, I'm planned, I'm organized, I'm prepared. So we have to, each one of us has to find out when we feel secure. When I feel secure, it's not ultimately secure because there's no ultimate security in the material world. But relatively speaking, uh, the, if you see the mind's agitation, it's like it is, if there is too less, it's high up. If it's too much, it goes high up. But if it is in between, it comes on. It's at a relatively balanced level. So a relatively manageable level. It's like I can lift 10 kg and lift 10 kg or 11 kg 
or 12 kg, I stretch my muscles, I improve a little bit. So we have to find out that zone for ourselves. And we have to give others the space to find that zone for them. But sometimes, some uh, we all go through phases. Sometimes we may become uh, too hard with ourselves. No, okay. Sometimes I may decide, you know, I will eat only, I will eat very less. But then after all, we find we can't sustain it. Sometimes we may just become too lax with ourselves. So then again, uh, we may have to introspect or we may have to get some inputs from others and we balance. But it's a, it's if we are practicing sadhana bhakti reasonably well, then that brings us at least for some time of the day in the mode of goodness. If we chant, if we do worship the deities, if we study scripture, if we hear classes, at least for some time we come to the mode of goodness. And that is the time when we can evaluate. In the mode of passion and mode of ignorance, it is very, very difficult to evaluate properly. In the mode of passion, we'll feel that I just want to earn more and more and more. In the mode of ignorance, we will be we will be irresponsible and we'll say I'm detached. <laughs> but that is our, that there's a big difference between irresponsibility and detachment. Irresponsibility is like a student has an exam. Student doesn't prepare for the exam. Mother says, I'm not studying. I'm detached. <laughs> <laughs> that is not detachment. Generally, the key difference between irresponsibility and detachment is that irresponsibility is before doing the work. Detachment is after doing the work. So I do my work and then I don't stay emotionally entangled in that. If I don't do my work only, then that is irresponsibility. So generally, if you're in the mode of ignorance, we will just uh, be lazy and think I'm being detached. So it's when, when the, uh, throughout the day, sometimes we are in the mode of goodness. So, so sometimes if you have a specific issue we want to think about, then maybe on a weekend or sometime when we have some time, we pray, we, re, we bring ourselves to the mode of goodness and then calmly reflect. And based on that reflection, we arrive at a general plan for our life. This sort of decision of you know, how much to earn, how much to save, how much to give in charity. These we can't uh, do uh, on the on the and the heat of the moment because that will be impulsive decision and that will not think about it so well so we have some time in the mode of goodness when we reflect and then we get a general direction for our life this is what this much time this this much time this this much charity this much saving this much expenditure we plan and then sometimes we may make a little adjustment as life comes along but at least the broad path is clear but if that broad path we try to discern when we are in the mode of passion and ignorance then we will err on either the wrong side of, uh, we'll either on some wrong side, we'll err on that wrong side. So over a period of time, uh, Krishna, Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Instruction Introduction that when we come to the mode of goodness, how to advance further will be revealed from within. So that revealed from within doesn't mean that we reject external guidance, but that we, uh, whatever we have heard from, uh, heard in classes, heard in scripture, you now we understand by the guidance from within, how I can apply it in my life. Which part I can apply now, which part is not so practical for me now. Uh, which is So that all that understanding, clarity we get when we come to the mode of goodness while by practicing bhakti. To answer your question. Thank okay. you. Yes. Um, how do you get yourself really more and read? Oh. How do you get motivated to chant more and read more? Generally, three things. That is, our desires, where do they come from? They come from attraction, they come from conviction, they come from association. Three things, broadly speaking. When, why, do I, why do I do something? Because I like to do it. Or why do I do something? Because I know it is important for me. Why do I do something? Because all my friends are doing it, so I do it. Hmm? Say, like, if you see in your life, you play, you may play some sports, you may play cricket, because say you like cricket, but then you go to school and you see that everybody else is playing, say, football. So, then you want to be a part of them, so you play that sport. Also. That's because of association. Or you may decide you, know, you want to go to the gym and do some workout. You may not enjoy that, but I need to be healthy, so we do that because of conviction. So broadly speaking. Our actions are shaped by these three things. Our attraction, 
our conviction and our association. So whatever we want to do, devotional activity, if it is chanting or it is uh, reading more and more, we have to see which of these three forces are lacking and how can we increase those. So with respect to <coughs> attraction, sometimes we feel attracted towards uh, chanting, sometimes we don't feel attracted. Our mind is so fickle. Some days we feel like chanting is so nice. But Sometimes we feel we start chanting and we feel oh I feel so much strength. This is so good. I want to chant more and more. Sometimes we feel chanting should never end. And the next day we feel chanting never ends. <laughs> <laughs> it just needs to go on and on and on. So attraction is not a steady platform for us for us to do anything. Our mind is very fickle. So, Jiva Goswami says that in the sadhaka stage, uh, Preeti will not keep us in Bhakti. For the Siddha, when we are purified, when we are realized, Preeti will keep us in Bhakti, affection, attraction. But in the sadhaka stage, it is Buddhi that keeps us in Bhakti. The Buddhi is intelligence. So that's why if we want to do any activity, we have to nourish our intelligence about its, important, about its importance. So suppose we hear some class about uh, why it is important to read this, to read, or why it is important to chant. Then maybe note something down and keep it with us. And when we don't feel like doing it, we read it. That gives the conviction. Now, in general, doing something based on attraction is joyful. Doing based something based on conviction is not so joyful. Like, I, I, I know this is important, but I don't feel like doing it. So what can make it joyful is association. In general, our desires, we think of them as linear. Hmm? Say, I see a gulab jamun and I want to eat it. So I see the object and I get the desire. But our desires are not just linear. They are also triangular. Triangular means that, say, I had gone to Austra Australia first time and we were at a devotee's house and they said, we have made baklava. We like baklava. Now, I had never heard of a baklava. <laughs> and the, the name is not a very place, baklava. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. Uh, I said, I said, I didn't say anything. Then there was a devotee with me. And then he got the baklava and he just took it and he ate it. And he was in bliss. <laughs> I see you. I said, give me one also. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened is, just see, hearing or seeing the baklava did not give the desire. But seeing someone else enjoying it, that gave the desire. <laughs> so that is triangular desire. So just seeing the object doesn't give the desire, but seeing other someone else enjoying that object gives us the desire. So uh, this is especially true, this triangularity of desire is especially important in spiritual life, because many of the activities in spiritual life may not initially seem so enjoyable. So maybe Kirtans may seem enjoyable, but other activities may not seem that enjoyable. So if we have some friends who are doing it, then seeing them, oh, so if we decide that we have a friend, we decide to memorize one verse per week. And then every Sunday we will discuss the verse. And then on Sunday you go, now he's going to ask you what is the verse, and you're going to ask him which is the verse you memorized. Then just looking forward to it, oh, you know, you'll ask me. That will give us the inspiration to memorize. And you will ask him, hey, what have you memorized? What have you memorized? So that way, when we see others doing something, that is what gives us inspiration. So broadly speaking, we will see uh, which of these we need to increase. So attraction, conviction, association. And if you can increase either of these also, sometimes there will be no association, there will be no attraction. But if there's conviction, we keep doing it. Seeing, other, seeing us, others may start. And then we will be the association for them. And then after that, they will also become the association for us. So that way we can increase our uh, 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 our inclination to do devotional activities. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Yes. So, how do we balance success and failure from an emotional perspective? And also, how do I balance between staying passionate towards my goal or whatever it is I want to achieve and also staying passionate. Okay. <clears throat> so how can we 
be passionate about a goal and still be detached? See, the word passion is one of the words which in material life and spiritual life has opposite connotations. In spiritual life, you say, don't be in the mood of passion. Don't be in passion. It's bad. But in material life, I say, you should have a passion. You know, you have to find out what your passion and pursue that passion. So the way I reconcile it is, we can have a passion, but we shouldn't be in passion. <laughs> we can have a passion. That means we have some inspiration, some driving force. This is what I would like to work on. This is what I want to do. We can have but we don't want to be in the mood of passion. So the word passion in material life, it means something which is something which we are very driven about, which you feel strongly about, which you just want to do strongly. Uh, and in, in the spiritual circle, passion means the mode of uh, mo, mo, Rajoguna, where we act impulsively. Enthusiasm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you are saying it in the more in the sense of having a driving force. But so uh, well, now, with respect to the practice of bhakti, earlier I said that if we see success more as a direction than as a destination. So for example, say, uh, say uh, I want to become a doctor, I want to become an engineer, I want to become a writer. Now it's just one thing is, okay, I want to get a particular degree or I want to get a particular job. That's you could say that is becoming a, becoming a particular thing in a career. But that is just one landmark along the way. So it's a direction which you are pursuing. And if we uh, focus in every situation, sometimes we define success in terms of the results that we get. Mm -hmm. uh, say, you know, if I get this many marks, that's I'm successful. If I get this job, I'm successful. If I get into this college, I'm successful. Just we live in a competitive world and those external markers of success do matter. But we cannot wed ourselves only to them because sometimes they may come and sometimes they may not come so we need to okay this is what I feel inspired to do and this is the value that I want to live according to that say I will do my best in this field so if we define success more in terms of not expectation of what we'll get but the contribution that we will make then if we decide this say this is I want to be a good student and I want to study diligently and I want to uh, contribute that way. If I make that as my goal, success will come. And even if success sometimes doesn't come, but still I'm moving in that direction, sooner or later that will come. So we, if we define success too much in terms of expectation of what I will get, then if I get it, I'll be elated. But what after that? Okay, then I have to set another goal. And I start pursuing another goal. So, and if I don't get it, I feel devastated. So this, the balance between success and failure, uh, not getting too buffeted by either, that can be achieved when we redefine success as living in harmony with our values. So Krishna has given me some abilities, Krishna has given me some interests, and I want to use them fully. So I work hard to develop those, uh, to do justice to those talents, to develop those interests. And whatever I am able to achieve, that is my contribution through that. If some results come, that's wonderful. If we, if we focus too much on success in terms of achieving certain goals, then we get alienated from our values. And then even if we achieve success, that success doesn't bring any fulfillment. Because you say, if, now recently if you see, there was this ball tampering scandal that happened in cricket. An Australian cricket team was accused of that. And several of the captain, vice captain were disgraced. So what happened? They, success, they tried success at all costs. So for that, somehow or the other, we have to win this match. Now they were caught over there. And they realized the cost was too much for them. So what happens if you obsess too much with success and we lose perspective? If a team performs properly, sooner or later they will be successful. But instead of improving the performance, if they somehow try to a hook or crook get success, that has counterproductive results. So Arjuna, he was quite clear. He, he wanted to be a great archer and he practiced very hard. For that. He didn't neglect his archery practice. He was continuously was doing that. But then, he did not he did not let that become an obsession where he neglected everything else. 
So he practiced dharma. He had time for doing dharmic activities. He had uh, he he when he had to practice archery, he was completely diligent about it. But that doesn't mean that he neglected other things. So if we see that uh, we are parts of Krishna and we have to connect with Krishna. So there are many channels through which we connect with Krishna. So our bhakti, our chanting the holy names and doing bhakti activity, that is that is a very important channel through which we connect with, through which we connect with Krishna. But our career and the, the contribution that we make using the gift that Krishna has given us, that is also a connect channel by which you connect with Krishna. So if we see, when I said success is more of a direction, for us the direction is that I want to do this in a mood of devotional offering to Krishna. So if I see that this is meant to connect with Krishna, then I won't get so obsessed with it that, that in doing it, I get disconnected from Krishna. So seeing that our gifts are given to us by Krishna and are meant to use it in his service. We, if we see that vision, then we can have that passion, but we won't get obsessed with it. Because we'll see that when Krishna wills, the results will come. But if I keep persevering, Krishna is observing that, Krishna will appreciate that. And eventually the reward will come. So it said that what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. So we see even our career and our pursuits in our day-to-day -day life also as a as a devotional pursuit by seeing the connectedness of it with Krishna. Okay? Okay. Hey, Krishna. Yes, oh, Just trying to there's a question. Uh, good way. Um, so we talked about uh, decisions, we talked about financial management and uh, we also talked about the principle of charity. And then recently we are a little over 50 years of uh, ISKCON. Mm. And then we have more temples than uh, you know the day when ISKCON was started or even after Prabhupada uh, left mm. the world. So the question is sometimes when we take decisions, like I mean we are asked a lot of uh, you know congregations in different parts of the world mm. are aspiring to build more, uh, you know, bigger temples. Mm. But at the same time, the fact is if you look at the number of uh, if there is like thousand people in the congregation in the particular city there's only like one percent of the uh, people who are actually managing or you know giving charity to the temple and running the whole uh, temple from maintenance to uh, everything else included mm. and the rest are like you know 99 percent in the congregation or in the, or in the city uh, in the city like i mean there are like thousand congregation people and there's one person who are actually managing but there could be more number of people okay. too where there is higher yeah. potential to get them mm. or you know to closer to Krishna consciousness. So now the question is like we talked about decisions. So sometimes we aspire to build uh, bigger temples, mm. but at the same time not realizing the fact that you know there's a lot of maintenance and a lot of uh, sustainability uh, would be a concern in a longer run. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, those kind of decisions, if as an individual, if you had to take it in your own house. Let's say if you're making 100k and then you would prefer to be in a million dollar home, right? So you don't take those decisions in at your personal level, but then at a bigger level, like aspiring for uh, you know to build bigger temples for Krishna. So sometimes you end up taking those decisions and taking the risk, but not realizing the sustenance and you know the maintenance and how you know uh, making it for a longer run for future generations. So how do we like sync up all that and you know what what would you suggest uh since you're building a new temple as you know mm -hmm. so that it will help us in making the right decisions Thank you. <coughs> suppose so if you're building a big temple but then we it involves taking a huge amount of risk because there are not many people who are going to contribute or even maintain the temple regularly and we may not even take that kind of risk for building a home for ourselves so how can we make uh, such activity sustainable? Let's say that there are different ways of doing devotional service to Krishna. And different devotees are inspired differently. So Bhakti is so inclusive 
that it accommodates different people to different inclinations. So <clears throat> we could say that, as you said, that a small number of people are going to actually run the temple. So that is how it always is. It's like a pyramid where there are some people who are extremely dedicated. There are some people who are okay, somewhat dedicated. Occasionally they will take up some commitment. Some people they say, if you go to meet somebody, I regularly come to the temple. How regularly? Once a year on Janmashtami. <laughs> <laughs> that is the regularity. They think I'm being regular. <laughs> so, there, so what happens is people will be at different levels of uh, commitment and dedication. And uh, certainly we need a, uh, some, if you're going to have a big project, we need a certain number of dedicated people, no doubt. But at the same time, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada also had that principle that if you want to shoot, go and shoot a rhino. It's so difficult, people say, if you don't do it, okay, but it will not be possible only. If you do it, people will be amazed. So now, in general, the, the construction of the temple, if it is emerging from the presence of a well-developed congregation, the temple can, be, can serve many different purposes. One purpose, traditionally when Indians build temple, it is more of a, uh, uh, it's a pious instinct. You know, okay, I have wealth and I want to use it for some good purpose and I build a big temple for the Lord. So there will be some devote, some people, even the devotee community who have that instinct. I want to build a temple for the Lord. So that is, uh, that is some instinct some people have, but Srila Prabhupada, the way he presented is, uh, the temple is meant to help us it is meant to become like the uh, center uh, for outreach. So we want the temple primarily as a facility for doing vibrant outreach. Now, if we have a good congregation in a place and we have uh, good preaching programs going on to, uh, by which that congregation will be maintained and will expand, then having a big temple can be can serve as a big fillip, big boost for the preaching. So how, how does that happen? Because generally when we are doing preaching, one of the biggest challenges is to invite people. How are people going to come to promote the program? So generally people who are in the material world, they are attracted by materially impressive things. So if there is a big temple, they will come to see what is the big temple. We have a small temple, okay, we'll say, okay, we'll go, we may not go. So the challenge comes if we build a big temple, but in building the temple and in maintaining the temple, so much of the energy goes that because of that, preaching stops. So the energy that was done for uh, getting people to Krishna, that energy gets diverted to building a temple. And then people are coming to the temple, but there's nobody to preach to them. Because everybody is caught in fundraising. Everybody is caught in maintenance. So if that isn't, uh, if uh, the if that's why in general the the mood which we have is one of first have a congregation, a stable congregation, then build a temple, and then the temple will expand the congregation. So if without a congregation we try to build a temple, and then think after that we'll attract a congregation. Yes, we'll attract a big congregation, but there will be nobody to actually connect the people who are coming to temple to become devotees. So then that time the temple becomes more like a uh, center for religious tourism, <laughs> not a center for spiritual transformation. There are many temples which are on the uh, tourist uh, locations of a particular place, tourist attraction, and a lot of people come there. But then it doesn't lead to spiritual transformation. So if we uh, have a structure for preaching going on, and we are able to continue that study, then a temple can actually work to attract a lot of people also. And we have to, there is this both, there is the element of uh, using our intelligence in Krishna's service. So sometimes it is said that, do we surrender uh, with our intelligence to Krishna or do we surrender our intelligence to Krishna? Isn't it? That means, do I use my intelligence to surrender to Krishna 
or I just surrender with Krishna. Krishna, I don't know how this is going to work out. This is what you want. I'll do it. So there are both. Prabhupada, when he went to America, he had no idea what kind of people he would meet, what what would happen. So he surrendered with intelligence in the sense that he took a stock of vegetarian food with him. He took some of his books with him. He made sure that 62, 63, 64, three years, he wrote his books so that he would have something to authenticate. So many people can go, but he's this big volumes he has written that made him that that gave some weight to his uh, being a spiritual teacher. And so he, he surrendered with intelligence. But actually, when he went to America, it was extremely, you could say, either you can call it a courageous act or it, you could call it a rash act. An old person going all alone to America. So it said in Krishna consciousness, sometimes people ask, Do you believe in miracles? Since we don't believe in miracles, we depend on miracles. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prabhupada actually, it was almost like when he went to Jaladuta, it was, he was demanding Krishna perform some miracle now. <laughs> Otherwise, how will things happen? So, there are both aspects in Bhakti. We use our intelligence as far as it goes, but then sometimes we have to surrender with, surrender with our, not just surrender our intelligence also, Krishna. You have a plan, you will work it out. And if we build a big temple, then that also attracts people. Say that there are many people who have, not many, this is a huge number, but there are a significant number of people who want to do something significant in their lives. They want, they have a zeal, they want to contribute. But often such people, they say, okay, I want to be a part of some organization. They say, which organization is big? Which organization is influential? That's where they go and explore. And if they feel okay, so they will get connected with that. But if, say, if, even if we have a temple which makes it a part of the religious religious tourism map or the spiritual tourism map, then people who are who have an activist zeal, they come there because of that. And then they get connected. So at one level, we use our intelligence in wanting to do big things for Krishna. But on another level, we also understand that Krishna, is Krishna's intelligence is bigger than ours. And we uh, surrender to him also. So, if uh, again I said that it's more like a stretch, you know, talk, you talk about comfort zone, stretch zone, and panic zone. So it's like if I can lift 10 kg, I lift 11, 12 kg, that's good. But if I start lifting 50 kg, it's a problem. So, similarly, we may have a big plan for a temple, but you know, that, that should not become so much of a pressure that it disrupts our normal devotional activities or our normal life. Certainly we have to stretch ourselves, but it shouldn't become an overbearing tension. So if you find that it is becoming an overbearing tension, then we may decide that, okay, this was our deadline, but in bhakti, you know, sometimes we have to make the deadline into live line. You know, okay, not this, we can do it a little later, a little later, that's okay. So the desire to do something wonderful for Krishna is a wonderful desire. At the same time, we have to temper it with uh, there is there is in bhakti there is transcendental faith and there is sattvaguna intelligence. So both are required. That sattvaguna intelligence means with my intelligence I analyze what is realistically possible, what is not realistically possible. But then there is transcendental faith also, which goes beyond the sattvaguna intelligence. So we just uh, do our best, and we can make a big plan for Krishna. And if it doesn't materialize immediately then we don't become uh, compulsively attached to it. Shishila Prabhupada had big plans for Krishna. At the same time, he was also flexible. He tried so many things. He tried League of Devotees, it didn't work. He tried Back to God, it didn't work. He worked with his God brothers, it didn't work. He went to, he just focused on writing his books and distributing his books on the street, go to the libraries. That worked to some extent, but not much in terms of getting. So he was flexible in trying different things. So we see that the purpose is to glorify Krishna by building a big temple. And we focus on uh, sometimes having a tangible, uh, substantial goal. That is what drives people to do something. Otherwise, see, we have some Rajoguna within us. And for most of us, uh, if we didn't have some tangible things to do, Bhakti would be too sattvic. <laughs> if you tell somebody, study Shastra. <coughs> okay, yeah, I'll study. You have Bhakti Shastri exam now, study Shastra. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll study now. So what happens is, even when we want to do transcendental activities, unless there are some tangible goals, it's very difficult for us to do them. 
so in that sense although sometimes it may appear like we are in the mode of passion <coughs> but if we are pursuing a transcendental goal then we are channeling the energy of passion which is already there within us in krishna service and if we don't do that then we will end up doing something else with that passion so we can see these sort of challenges uh, challenging uh, services in bhakti as avenues for channeling our passion which would otherwise drag us in different directions so the answer your question yeah. Yes, Prabhu. It's a combination of question from Guru's class and Spirit's class. So, maybe it's, I think it's related. So, he said, um, the flight and fight, mm. the third is more of this side. So, when you have Krishna within, so, just because of lack of Krishna within, that is a problem. But that one, I mean, constant, constant newness is also Krishna. I can use such a the state of heart, the state of heart, and combination. Mm. So I want to know these two questions. Now, what is the newness? Because chanting, reading, playing, mm. association is there, but at the same activity, finding the newness, and that's one. And the second thing is that in terms of fight and flight, the developing more of the that means having the content as Krishna became. What does it mean? Thinking Krishna. But it's a deity worship. I'm seeing Krishna is Krishna to me. Or when okay. the ambiguity comes, acting in such a way that. So, how does that. Uh, I don't know how to put this together, okay. but these two, uh, two points. Okay. What are the first part? First part is newness. Okay, yeah. And the second thing is that. The yeah, so, is. when we say that <coughs> Krishna Bhakti, there is constant newness. And then we also say that by having Krishna in our hearts, we can go beyond the fight of life responses. What does it mean? Mm. With respect to remembering Krishna constantly, now one of the most realistic ways in which we can be conscious of Krishna is being conscious of our purpose in Krishna's service. In the lecture, Arjuna Prabhupada uh, says, Now, how do we know whether we are Krishna conscious? He says, If you go to the temple and you look at the deities, if you feel Krishna is asking you, what are you doing for me? Then you are Krishna conscious. It's a beautiful definition. What are you doing for me? Most people go to a temple and ask, what are you doing for me? <laughs> 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 so that is the Karmakandi kind of approaching God. She's also a catalyst here approaching God. But then there is the, there could be a Sahajiyai way of approaching God. You know? I think, Oh, connecting Krishna, always chanting Krishna's name, Radhe Radhe, Sham Sham, chanting Radha Rani, Krishna's names. That is also good, but at our level, it can be sentimental. So, we, our relationship with Krishna is primarily a relationship of service. Once a person came to Prabhupada and he says, Swamiji, Krishna came in my dream yesterday. So, Prabhupada, nonchalant, he looked at me and said, All right, serve him today. <laughs> serve him today. Okay, even if Krishna comes in the dream, that's fine if he comes also. But what is our effect? Our relationship with Krishna is primarily based on our service to him. So, uh, the most tangible way uh, we can be conscious of Krishna is conscious of our purpose in his service. So, when the Bhakti Sama Sindhu it talks about uh, Nama Dhyan, Rupa Dhyan, Leela Dhyan, and Seva Dhyan. So, meditating on the name, meditating on the pastimes, meditating on the form and meditating on the service. So for us, as a sadhana, we do Nam Dhan, Nyan, Rup Dhan, Seva, Lila Dhan also. We hear about, we meditate on the deities, we chant the holy names. But actually the most realistic for us to do is the Seva Dhan. So we become conscious of Krishna by our purpose, by being conscious of our purpose. What is my purpose in Krishna's service? Having said that, if we keep the purpose in the center of our consciousness, then slowly everything falls in place. Now, purpose provides perspective. Purpose provides perspective. What do I mean by that? Suppose you say if we are going to have some important meeting and along the way we meet someone and they want to talk with us. Now, as a courtesy, we may talk for a few minutes. If the meeting is very important, we'll say, okay, we'll talk later. I have a purpose that helps me to decide how much time to give to this, how much it's something really important. Let's fix up a time we'll meet tomorrow and talk. But if I don't have any purpose, 
they they might just go and i might chit chat for several hours also so if i now uh, if i have a purpose then that helps me to see this is more important this is less important so in fight or flight responses basically our purpose doesn't uh, stay in the focus of our consciousness simply our security or our uh, position that is what stays in the center of my consciousness so you know i this person is threatening me like this how dare i will show you then our focus becomes on <coughs> retaliating against that person so or it can be that this person you know so powerful is threatening me i have to get out of here so if my focus is okay i am here to serve krishna and this person is acting in this way what how best can i serve krishna in this situation sometimes i may choose the same response i may fight or i may i may just go out of the situation that's also okay but i will do it with the understanding of how best i can serve krishna so this purpose how does it come to some extent it comes by a sadhana bhakti because the desire to serve krishna is the is what is strengthened by the practice of sadhana bhakti no one time one devotee is telling me i say i'm afraid to chant hari krishna so why he said chanting hari krishna means praying to krishna please engage me in your service i already have too much service <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so actually chanting hari krishna is when you say please engage me in your service what it means is please give me more desire to serve is not that, nobody expects us to have more than 24 hours in a day nobody expects us to be more than at more than one place at the same time that's understandable but what we are asking for when you say please engage me in your service means that please give me the desire to serve so our sadhana bhakti is what Uh, strengthens our purpose in krishna service similarly associating with like minded devotees also strengthens our sense of purpose and especially our uh, our desire to serve and please senior vaishnavas that is a, a driving that can give us a that can give us a driving sense of purpose also yes se prasada bhagavat prasad so sometimes that purpose may come through a specific instruction like say hanuman was told to go and find sita for a specific purpose prabhupada was told go and preach in the western world uh, but if you see arjuna was never told us the no one particular point arjuna was given a specific purpose he was told that no he just observed himself when he was in drona's gurukul he found that he was good at archery and he developed that so if we have that intention to serve krishna then the specific purpose how we can serve him that will also be revealed gradually and um, if we keep that purpose clear then uh that purpose is what will bring newness at our level because satsarup maharaj in the lilamrit writes that preaching is adventure in the service of the lord because yes when you activities in bhakti okay i go to i chant every day i do deity worship and they are at a spiritual level when we connect with krishna because krishna is unlimitedly attractive we will start releasing the attractiveness of krishna but at our level sometimes it appears monotonous and we can't just uh, wish away that feeling of monotony it is there right so <clears throat> sometimes we say that we give a class and everybody seems to be asleep and tired or bored not interested in the class i was at a class and then you know i just one devotee who was giving a class and he was told you respect giving a very boring class <laughs> and then when he was doing that and he was telling everybody was falling asleep he says all of you should have a taste for krishna katha <laughs> so now i was thinking in my mind yes i am i don't have that taste but at one level if we all have a service attitude then that means the hearers should think that you know i should try to hear attentively But the speaker should also think that I should speak in a way that helps the audience to become absorbed. The speaker should not just demand; we should have taste. Rather, speaker should speak in a way that gives audience the taste.
so create so so that's a prabhupad writes realization means to speak in a way that is interesting to the audience so i understand where the audience are at what will what is their level of consciousness what are their needs what are their interests what are their concerns and then i speak accordingly so uh, at our level because we cannot spiritually connect with krishna directly chaitanya mahaprabhu has said that could hear 100 times the past time of guru past time of prahlad we are spiritually connecting with krishna directly but because we can't spiritually connect with krishna at our level of consciousness sometimes it may happen but not regularly that's why in our activities we have to have a sense of purpose and if i'm doing some purposeful devotional activity then that purpose gives me some excitement some sense of excitement some sense of achievement okay i want to do this i want to do this program we want to get this many people for this program we want to we want to distribute this many books we want to build this temple these alone are not devotion now it is our internal attitude that is devotional but these help us to have the connection by which that internal attitude will gradually develop so sometimes uh, going back to your question earlier sometimes you know trying to do something wonderful in krishna service that is what actually helps us to see the hand of krishna sometimes we just chant the holy names again and again and again but i may not feel any connection with krishna but sometimes i try to do something very difficult in krishna service and then when we find that that's not going to work at all we try our best and he realizes it's not going to work and then we just surrender to krishna and then krishna suddenly makes it work so then we start saying actually it's krishna acting it's krishna acting so sometimes for us that uh, that's taking up challenging service in krishna service that gives us a sense of newness both newness in terms of we have some stimulating engagement and then we also see krishna's reciprocation in our life so that way we we have to uh, we don't necessarily have to do think that the forms of the same forms of devotion service cannot give newness they can give but if they are not giving us something new right now then we have to create stimulation for ourselves so shri prabhupad talked about chanting constantly he said that but prabhupad also created challenging engagements for devotees so go and distribute books prabhupad was amazing in giving challenges to people when he came back in 1968 to america he after he was sick for some time gone to india so they had a globe over there and prabhupada told his disciples all of you take one country <laughs> <laughs> go there preach krishna go here and deliver the country so now most of the disciples are 20 22 25 years old so i think one one mata janaki mata ji or one of them she was 19 years old so she was prabhupada what about us girls says we are not boys or girls we are souls you also pick up <laughs> <laughs> you also become one country <laughs> <laughs> so prabhupad actually give very stimulating challenging activities for people to do by which they could uh, they could channel their passion so they could get that sense of adventure newness so we have to we will find the newness primarily in our service to krishna but if we are in the association of very advanced devotees whenever we get it sometimes we go to yatra and there are some very advanced version of us speak krishna katha it will be same krishna katha but at that time we find there's so much taste over there so much relation over there so generally that spiritual newness uh, is relished when we are at the spiritual level of consciousness or when we are associating with someone who is at the spiritual level of consciousness so just like sometimes some advanced devotees do kirtan they may sing a simple tune you get absorbed if so deep in it otherwise you know if some if you want to be absorbed in kirtans then if some devotee comes in very good at music nice instruments and then we feel like the kirtan because there that's that's although it's a holy name it's more of material newness some new tune is there some new instrument is there some new singer is there so we, our operational principle is yena kena prakare mana krishna nivesh to fix the mind on krishna somehow or the other so if we can experience spiritual newness by our own spiritual advancement or by association of spiritual the advanced devotee that's wonderful if we can't then through cre- to having challenging services in krishna service uh, uh, challenges in krishna service we create newness and that's how we realize krishna's uh, krishna acting in our lives krishna empowering us in our lives so both in terms of our endeavor 
and in terms of Krishna's reciprocation. Both we experience some newness, some challenge, some stimulation out there. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So Prabhu, there are four sample apps, right? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So our mind keeps on judging others always. Hmm. Even though we don't want to, we know it is not hmm. good. But how to Yeah, our mind keeps judging others, what to do about it. Generally, the mind is, it has its own habits. And we can't suddenly get rid of that habit. We can't just undo it. So the best thing to do is to have something else to do. It's, uh, that means... If I am interacting with someone, then this person is very forgetful. This person is very irresponsible. This person is like that. This person is like that. My mind is saying like that. So many times, when we are in some situation, we don't. We are not in tune with the situation. We are in tune with our mind's commentary on the situation, and that's why it's like we are not dealing with that person. We are dealing with what our mind is telling us about that person. Then we can't effectively have that interaction. So if we just, okay, the mind is judging like this. Uh, if we if we try to argue with the mind, the mind is so expert. <laughs> it will, even if it doesn't defeat us, it will defeat our purpose. Because why? Even if we win the argument, with the mind, no, no, it's not like this. But we got distracted over there. So in some situations, we may have to uh, reason with the mind also but in general the best thing to do with it is just focus on something else mm -hmm. so okay I'm here for discussing about this service with this devotee so if I focus on that then okay the mind is saying like this it is saying but I don't focus on it it's like the tomorrow in OSC I'm going to speak about this elaborately if we the topic I'm talking net surfing or net suffering so basically if we consider uh, our mind is like a monitor in which uh, say we want to I'm talking with this person right now so that is what should be the focus on my mind but our mind is like a computer monitor on which many tabs are open <laughs> so, so what happens is so while we are talking with that person the mind opens up a tab this person is lazy this person is forgetful this person is manipulative, this person is like this. And then, now when that tab opens, it is right there. Now sometimes some tabs open in such a way, if some advertisements are there, you can't find the cross, where is it to remove it? <laughs> <laughs> so, like that, if you try to cross, you know, it's quite difficult to find it. But, if you just, okay, the tab has opened, push it a little bit aside and focus on what we are, what we are doing right now. And the Prabhupada says that the, one of the best ways to deal with the mind is neglect. Neglect means that we don't we don't get into a discussion with the mind at that time. Okay, this has popped up. Let it be there, but let me focus on this. So it's like a pop up. Maybe later on we can close it. Later on, uh, later on we can uh, evaluate it. We can discuss it. But sometimes the if we are in the in the heat of action. At that time, to deal with the mind, it becomes quite difficult. So if I learn in general, so at that time, I just focus on my purpose and keep that suspended. And it's not that always what the mind says is wrong. Now, sometimes we have had experience that this person is always very forgetful. If I have something important to do, and if I count on them and they forget, I'll be in trouble. So uh, we may remember that also. So basically now, I'm not going to go into the difference between mind and intelligence here. Something pops up within us and something passes judgment. So now, what we have to do is, later on, at that time, we just focus on doing what requires to be done, but afterwards, we can evaluate. Okay, so uh, I had this thought at this time. And uh, yeah, and based on my past experiences, too, this theory forgets all the time. So then maybe I, I had to make up some backup plan. Make some, or make some backup plan. Or, okay, it just happened once, but... Everybody else says this devotee is very reliable. So I shouldn't extrapolate based on one experience. Let me give the benefit of doubt to this devotee. 
the when the mind passes comments at that time if you try to deal with the external situation and also deal with the internal comment it becomes overload for us so at that time you can just keep it suspended and especially if you are interacting with someone regularly then we know how our mind passes judgments then at our at our at a time when we are calm reflective at that time we evaluate what the mind is saying and then we uh, arrive at our own understanding of how to respond to the mind so judging is a habit which everyone has some have it more some have it less what we need to do is we make sure that it whatever the mind is doing we have to evaluate whether it's assisting me in my service or it's impeding me in my service sometimes if i have a responsible position i have to get things done then understanding who has what strengths and weaknesses that is important for me but if i'm just interacting at a social level with somebody then trying to have neg having entertaining negative thoughts about others that is simply going to impede my devotional interactions with them so if uh, the other way to look at this also is that yes i'm judging this devotee for this fault but i may also have i also have faults so if we generally what happens is if we are good at something and somebody else is poor at it then we become quite judgmental about it mm -hmm. so we often compare others weaknesses with our strengths but we compare their weaknesses with our weaknesses my weaknesses may be in some other field no okay this person is very forgetful okay they are forgetful but then i may also have my weakness i may be not very sensitive i am a little short tempered or right, so then and then if i think that no oh, i want to give up my my short tempered attitude but it's so difficult to give it up just as i have a struggle in overcoming my conditioning similarly they have a struggle in overcoming their conditioning that may not be a weakness for them but it is a weakness for uh, that, that is that may not be a weakness for me but it is for them so if we Uh, if we see that we all are souls who want to serve krishna and we all are impeded by our particular conditionings so the specific conditioning may be different but the principle that material nature has infested us with certain conditionings that limit our service to krishna then what happens we don't see us and them as opposite on opposite sides we see we are all on the same side in the battle against material nature to serve krishna the specific weakness with me is different specific weakness with them is different so uh, we if we can see that rather than judging this devotee this is the weakness in them we can identify that we can't uh, neglect that completely but if you see yeah i have my weaknesses they have their weaknesses but all these weaknesses are ultimately created by material nature's conditionings and that material nature is what we are all trying to fight then rather than we and they being on the two opposite sides we can all we can both be on the same side and we fight together against uh, against material nature and uh, uh, to serve krishna so instead of uh, instead of criticizing and condemning we can be complimenting and complimenting the compliment is compliment l i m e n t and l e m e n t compliment means appreciate the good that is there in them so okay i can see this fault but i can see this good also is there so i appreciate the good and if they have some weakness let me make up for that let me compliment that you can comp uh, so yeah okay this devotee is forgetful that means i just have to do that if i have to i have, i may have to give an extra reminder to them or to extra reminders to them so we if we can see that we are all partners rather than opponents then the judgmental attitude can go down substantially and so we can't deny if somebody has some weaknesses but we won't uh, we won't harp on it rather we'll help each other deal with it and move onwards okay thank you so just um, question is about four sampradayas so is the destination of all four sampradayas same sometimes it appears that destination of one sampradaya is superior to others um, okay sri sampradaya they can go far far and they don't go beyond far hmm. so how does how is it that Okay. Is the destination of the four sampradayas the same? It is same in the sense that everybody is going to be liberated. Everybody is going to attain Krishna. Uh, 
within that based on individual attraction to a particular form each may go to a particular destination so there is the in bhakti there is a confidential or a specific aspect and there is a universal aspect and at the right time we have to focus on the right thing so for example our gaudiya vishnu acharyas when they are talking about the glory of krishna when they are talking about the glory of vrindavan krishna they will glorified in such a way that you know, all other destinations may seem not too so good golok vrindavan that is the highest but if you don't see that proper perspective we start trading you know, golok vrindavan is my goal and why couldn't I? that's like my backyard <laughs> <laughs> we start treating it like that why couldn't i also the spiritual one in chetan charitamrut he said that even shantaras has two characteristics one is complete detachment from matter and complete attachment to the law that's so such a limited state in shantaras so it's all uh, so in specific occasions when we want to understand the uh, speciality of gaudiya vaishnavism we may talk about the difference between golok vrindavan and other places but at other times we are understand that it's all the abode of the lord it's all a liberated destination and everybody will be supremely satisfied in that in the brihad bhagavata amrita when the gopa kumar goes to the spiritual world and first he goes to vaikuntha and then he stays in vaikuntha delighted to be in vaikuntha but then he not stay he feels some discontent and from vaikuntha he goes to uh, ayodhya and he's with ram and the associates of ram is very satisfied for some time but after some discontent comes again then he goes to dwarka is with krishna himself he satisfied but then again he feels a little discontent he says you know oh i am a gop kumar i want to worship krishna as gopal and then said he comes to the material world in golok in gokul bhulok vrindavan he performs sadhana he goes to golok vrindavan so through this the uh, sanatan goswami is describing how golok vrindavan is the highest destination but the significant point is he is describing that when he is in vaikuntha at that time the vaikuntha vasis think that vishnu is the supreme and they think krishna is the avatar of vishnu when he goes to ayodhya they think ram is supreme and they think all the avatars they come from ram and sanatan goswami doesn't give a in parent parenthesis no they are by the way they are wrong huh? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't do that there is there is there is room for transcendental subjectivity in the material world when we say subjective it means you know it's just your opinion but in the spiritual realm the highest is not just tattva highest is rasa so you want to understand the tattva but ultimately you want to experience rasa and if a devotee has attraction to ram and in that attraction to the ram the devotee feels that ram is my lord i don't know anyone other than ram and that is perfection what to speak of talking about sanatan goswami and brihad bhagavata amrit even in chaitanya lila also in murari gupta is devoted to ram chaitanya mahaprabhu is pleased with his devotion he tells him worship krishna he says no i can't do that i worship him i'm delighted so now it is also true that in our tradition murari gupta doesn't become initiating guru gadadhar pandit is one of the gadadhar pandit is there nitanand prabhu is there advaita acharya is there the form of the lines are coming down he murari gupta doesn't, doesn't become an initiating guru now but that doesn't mean that his devotion is not appreciated but in mahapur apri exemplary says that he says that the lord never abandons the devotee and the devotee never abandons the lord such is the greatness of bhakti so you appreciate that as an example of bhakti you say hey, you know you are worshiping ram lower level not like that so we have to respect devotion wherever we see it and uh, the lord is so infinitely all attractive yad yad diyat urugaya vibhavayanti ट्रैक्टेड टू राम 
the Lord will reveal Himself as Ram, and in Ram, that devotee will find all the attractive qualities of the Lord. So the destination is same in the sense that everybody will get the full satisfaction of pure love and pure loving absorption in Krishna. So in in the Lord, in which form of the Lord that may vary based on their rasa, but it is not that in terms of their experience. They will not have anything missing. It is that it's not. No, Hanuman doesn't think that. Okay, you know, I'm only worshiping Ram. I want to go to Goloka. Doesn't think that. Oh, you know, I I want to. I'm only in Dasyaras. I want to be like Bharat. He's fully satisfied in the devotion. So, in that sense, in the sense of getting full absorption, full satisfaction, pure love, the destination is the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. How how come like Rudra Sampradaya and Kuma Sampradaya, they also attain Vishnu as a reality? Is it true? That's what you're expecting. Yeah. If they worship Vishnu, they worship Vishnu primarily. I thought Rudra Sampradaya they go to Shri Lord Shiva. No, no. In that Shiva is a primary teacher. They are worshippers of Krishna. They are not worshippers of Shiva. Shiva is a primary teacher for them. Yes. By the way, you know, are we having prasadam here? Maybe if you want to start prasadam, you can start because it's already quite late. It's almost eight twenty, eight thirty. Yeah, you can pass the plate and you can continue question answers. We'll see first who is next. Next is Chandra. Yes. Can you describe the falling of the soul from the spiritual world to the material world? Can I describe the falling of the soul from the spiritual world to the material world? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question which is. Which is the favorite way of devotees to give themselves an intellectual headache? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's like no, it's basically uh, it's uh, something which happens, something which is not in the domain of time. It is some, not in the domain of time. It's quite difficult to understand. So. How the soul came from the spiritual world, whether the soul came from the spiritual world, the different uh, acharyas have given different statements. So Jiva Goswami has said something. Shri Prabhupada, Bhakti Nath Thakur has said something. Shri Prabhupada, sometimes he says Prabhupada says the soul fell from the spiritual world, but that's not the only thing that Prabhupada said. In a fourth canto, that uh, Jai Vijay Folikar's past and statement, Prabhupada says. Therefore, the conclusion is that a soul never falls from the spiritual world. So. When our own acharyas have taken uh, different state, have given different statements, then it's best not to become a become a campaigner for or against any statement. Mm. Now, if you are walking along a road, and if there's a banana peel, you know what happens? Put your foot on the banana peel, slip and fall. So this question is like an intellectual banana peel. <laughs> As soon as you get into this question. Uh, so I would say that because our acharyas are giving different statements, so whichever statement makes sense to us, okay, we accept that and move on. This is just not a question which is resolvable very easily, and there are some questions which we can, uh, by discussion, get some resolution. And if we get the resolution, that that we can make that as our operational conviction and move on with our life. Sometimes if we don't get a resolution, we can take that also as a Okay, this is something which I can't understand. Keep that aside and move on in our life. Don't get it's it's a it's a it's a unresolvable. It's it's not a definitively resolvable question either way. So, no, so you know whatever explanation you know whatever explanation you give, I have a reputation for it. <laughs> you know, I can argue for this. I can and I can point the problems with this. I can argue for this and I can point the problems for this. So let's not get into this. Yeah.
generally, uh, like, we always have to be grateful for many things. But the moment when we get, when the, our emotions take over and our minds, we get angry or sad or anything, immediately we forget gratefulness and we up things from the past and maybe future goals. And it all just comes together and it's just this big mess. And if we get to be grateful for, grateful for everything Krishna has given us, grateful for friends, family. So mm. how do we maintain that gratefulness throughout any situation? So when our emotions take over, then it's very difficult to maintain gratitude. Either past hurts or future goals, they come into our mind and then we lose our gratitude. Yes, there are two distinct things here. First is that uh, it is being grateful doesn't mean living in denial of the bad things that happen in life. When bad things happen, they are bad things. It's not that somehow we are supposed to imagine that they are good things. So, when bad things happen, it's difficult to be grateful. If, some, if we get some terrible disease, if we lose a job, if some relationship, a big complication comes up. So, lots of bad things happen in life. And so it's difficult to be grateful at that time. But we can differentiate between two things. You know, we can't be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. That means, if, I'm, if something terrible has happened in my life, I can't wish it away. Uh, and it is terrible. It is when Draupadi is dishonored, after that, when she goes to the forest, Krishna comes to meet him over there, meet, her, meet them all over there. And Draupadi is so upset. He says, Krishna, I called you. A disaster happened. Why didn't you come? He says, I'm your friend, I'm your cousin, I'm your devotee, I'm your relative. Why didn't you come to help me, Krishna? No, Krishna doesn't say over there, I have my perfect plans. How dare you challenge me? <laughs> Krishna doesn't take that. Krishna says, Actually, this demon Shalva had attacked Dwarka and I, had, I was caught in defending him. Protecting Dwarka and securing Dwarka. As soon as I came to know what had happened, I immediately came. If I had known the gambling match was going to take place, I would have come and stopped the match from taking place. So Krishna is, but then Krishna, is, Krishna doesn't take a, when God doesn't take a holier than thou attitude over there, he takes an understanding attitude. And then he says, No, you, even in such a great situation, difficult situation, you acted in a very honorable way. And, uh, uh, your honor will be redeemed. Your offenders will be punished with the Stay to the past, stay on the path of Dharma. So now we say that Krishna did come and he rescued, uh, protected her honor. But actually, nobody saw Krishna at that time. She just called out for help and an endless cloth came over there. But nobody saw Krishna. So that is Krishna directly and a personal vision was not there. So I'm giving this as an example to illustrate the point that when that terrible atrocity had happened on Draupadi, it was not that. She was grateful for that. And now they demanded that you be grateful for it. So bad things do happen in our life. And at that time, it is difficult to have a devotional disposition or a grateful disposition. So that's understandable. See, spiritualizing ourselves does not mean dehumanizing ourselves. Hmm? There are certain human emotions that do come up. So if we, if we lose someone, there's going to be grief at that. And there are, even in the Vedic tradition, there are there are practices by which grieving is done. When Dashrath Maharaj passes away, there's a 10-day statewide mourning that is done uh, in honor of him. So there are natural human emotions that are there in many situations. And they are understood. Oh, they are not to be denied. But what we need what we need to do is we don't have to wallow in those emotions. So it's uh, to give a simple example. Actually, I gave a series of classes on when I was in Melbourne. I gave emotionally healthy spirituality. So what that means is that say if uh, if I had an accident and my hand got broken, then I'll have to rest my hand. Even if I'm very spiritually advanced, that doesn't mean that my hand is going to function like normal. 
I'll have to rest the hand. And by resting, I'll let it recover. And then gradually after that, I start exercising my hand, according to medical advice. And then uh, the hand recovers and can function normally. So just because I'm spiritually advanced doesn't mean my hand injury will not affect me. It will not affect my consciousness, but it will affect my functioning. So what applies at the physical level also applies at the emotional level. Sometimes bad things happen and they can emotionally wound us. And if we get emotionally wounded by something, then we will need time to recover from that emotion. So giving ourselves that time, either we have to make time for it ourselves or others have to be understanding and give us that time, the understanding, the sympathy. They, then we take the time to recover. But if we just keep following in that forever, you know, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? If you just keep that as a perpetually replaying uh, uh, movie in our mind, why did he do this? Why did this happen? Why did... Then we will never recover. It's like I have a fractured hand and I never do any exercise or I keep scratching the bandaid or whatever. It's worsening it. So uh, <clears throat> we don't have to deny our human emotions, but we don't have to perpetuate them. Either. So we acknowledge that sometimes when it's going to be very, very difficult to be grateful. So I broadly say that at this time we can do three things. I said when uh, we can't be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. So how can we do that? Three broad things. First is that we can, when that bad thing has happened, we can look at what good things are there in my life. Okay, I got this terrible disease. I, still, I have a supportive family. I have good, I got health insurance. I've got a community which will help me. Uh, and I have overall a sturdy body. I'm young. There's so many things you're right in my life. So we can't be grateful for that particular thing, but we can be grateful for other things that are right in our life. That can at least give us some peace of mind. Otherwise, what the mind does is it sees one thing going wrong and it makes it appear as if now our whole world is collapsing. It's the end of the world. But by consciously shifting our attention towards the things that are good in our life, we can actually bring uh, some amount of peace. Then second is, we can look for the good things that are helping us to deal with this bad thing. So I have many good things in my life, so, but okay, I found a doctor who, who is expert in this field and who has, found a treat, who has got a treatment that works. And I can be grateful for that. So generally, what are the good things in my life? And specifically, what are the good things that are helping me to deal with this bad thing? And thirdly, bad things may happen, but Krishna is so expert that he can bring even good out of the bad. So how that will happen, I don't know. When that will happen, I don't know. But if I just try to maintain a devotional disposition, Krishna can bring good even out of the bad. If you look at the Pandavas, Terrible things happened to them, but each terrible thing actually made them stronger. When Duryodhana tried to poison Bhima, he poisoned him and threw him into the river. But then through that river, he went to Varunadev and Varunadev gave him a, several jars of nectar, celestial nectar, which made him 100 times stronger. When the Kauravas tried to burn the Pandavas in Varnabad, they escaped from there. And for some time, they were just literally like fugitives, incognito, in poverty. But eventually through that, they came to Drupada's kingdom and they won the hand of uh, Drupad. And at that time, there were two powerful kingdoms. One was uh, Kuru kingdom. The other was Drupada's kingdom, Panchala kingdom. So once the Pandavas formed an alliance with uh, Drupada uh, by marrying his daughter, then the whole game changed. Because still then, they were just, they were orphans living at Dhritarashtra's mercy. But now they were the uh, in-laws of the, the king was as powerful as he was. Then they be, So through all those adversities, they became more powerful. So we may not be able to see right now, we don't have to say that this is good, but this Krishna can bring good even out of this bad. That way, we can try to get a more devotional, a more grateful disposition. To answer your question? Thank you. Other questions? When uh, sometimes when somebody is about to leave the body, nobody is called up a person, 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 a
even though they have not done anything, any spiritual activity in their life, no, no, no. No, I took before coming. I had to waste it. Can you just get my laptop power cord? It's getting yes. situated. Yeah. So throughout their life, they may not have done any pious activity at all in that particular line. But when devotees go and offer to receive the garlands of deities, what would be the destination of the devotees? What exactly happens to them? Yeah. So if we offer Tulsi garland, or Tulsi garland of flower garland, Tulsi or flower garlands, we chant Hare Krishna near someone who is dying, so who has not practiced bhakti at all, what will be their destination? See, basically, remembering Krishna at the time of death is not a trick. It's not, it's not that I can I can live sensually throughout my life. I mean, I had enough of life. I take a gun. Put a gun near my phone, Hare Krishna! <laughs> and shoot myself. I can't <laughs> I can't trick Krishna like that. But what he says is Anta Kale Chamameva Smaran Muktwa Kaleva. It is I have to remember him. And this recollection is not like a factual recollection. Like you know, what is seven into eight? Ah, 56. Okay. It's not like a factual recollection. This recollection when Krishna talks about, it's more a. It's okay, it's there for some time. So it's more of a, a, a calling of the heart. Basically, if we have taken um, generally, what will we remember at the time of death? Usually, whenever there is danger, we gravitate towards. Uh, that which gives us shelter from the danger. Say, if I know a big tornado is coming, then I will go immediately to the secure most part of my house. I may go to the go to the go, okay, go down or some some cellars where it's very secure. So, like that, similarly at a psychological level or a certain level of consciousness, when death, which is the greatest danger, when death comes upon us at that time we will naturally think of that thing where we have experienced the greatest shelter. So if I have experienced my greatest shelter in say watching cricket, then at the time of death, even if chanting Hare Krishna is going around around me, I will not be chanting Hare Krishna, I will not be thinking of Hare Krishna. My thoughts will go to cricket. If my greatest security has been in money, then I will, my thoughts will gravitate towards money. So, uh, if we are actually to remember Krishna at the time of death, then we need to experience Krishna's shelter before death. Not just experience Krishna's shelter, but rather we should experience our greatest shelter in Krishna. We get shelter in many different things. We get shelter in our family members, we get shelter in our wealth, we get uh, shelter in our social social position and all the shelters are fine for functioning in this world but we have to have greatest shelter in Krishna without that we cannot attain Krishna because our heart is not attracted to him it's like say if we have a devotional satsang program and somebody who is not at all a devotee they come over there they come over there they feel out of place what am I doing over there so like that somebody who has never practiced bhakti even if they go to the spiritual world, they will feel out of place there. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> so, what can be done, what Krishna can do, is that there may be a little bhakti also, Krishna can magnify that. Like he did it with Putana, he had a little inclination of service, Krishna saw that and he highlighted it. And at the time of death, he cleansed her of all of her, all her sin and their reactions. But there has to be at least some devotional uh, inclination has to be there. So, what we are trying to do is when a person is about to depart, we try to create as devotional a situation setting around them as possible. By that, there will be at least some remembrance of Krishna. It may not be in the foreground, but it will be somewhere in the background. And at that time, 
like in ajamil's case uh, initially when he called out he was calling out to narayan addressing his son but vishwas jagdakur explains that initially when he called out narayan he was addressing his son but as that intention to address his son came out as his words then when he heard those words narayan at that time he remembered lord narayan and he thought oh you know what can this child protect me it is lord narayan will protect me. and it was that recollection of narayan he didn't intend to chant narayan but when he chanted he remembered narayan and that was what actually saved him i mean that did not liberate him what it did was it saved him from hell and gave him another chance so there is that book of shri prabhupada on his uh, on his story is called second chance got another chance so i would say that if we create auspiciousness uh, devotional auspiciousness for somebody that will definitely lead to an auspicious destination for them now what exactly will the nature of the auspicious destination that depends on uh, their own their own devotional inclination or lack of this if there is some remembrance of krishna that will count for their future spiritual careers but krishna doesn't impose on anyone's free will so that soul at least has to have some desire for krishna generally for us to go back to krishna you know if we have if krishna is our only desire then we'll surely go back to him but that even if that is not there at least if krishna is our greatest desire i may have a desire for this and that and that but if krishna is my greatest desire then also i can go back to krishna and if i have a small desire for krishna krishna can magnify it also krishna can magnify it by his mercy but unless we have some desire we cannot go to krishna but that stimulus at that time will create some auspiciousness because they have remembered krishna at that time at least in the background of their awareness they may go to a place where they can remember krishna more so we don't have to get too much into the zone of specifics you know what this is in they are going to get because in every situation something is in our hands and something is not in our hands so what is in our hands we do our best and what is not in our hands we leave it to krishna okay yes anybody has not yeah yes ma'am please anybody would not ask you know? So, okay. So sometimes the relationships are like uh, not good quality, and also, uh, what can, how can we get like good relationship with friends, you know, with the bodies, but sometimes it's tension in the place. Or we have like a some problems, but still we have to deal with the with the devotees every day, and we have to develop Krishna consciousness every day. <laughs> and doing our service or job, but dealing with all those things, how can we fix our mind in Krishna mm. and don't commit a harada like a shabda? So if you have a small community, yeah. then. and if we have we have to interact with some devotees but the relationship is strained then how can we continue our service without committing aparad generally there are some devotees whose association gives us strength and there are some devotees whose association takes our strength so both kind are there they said that some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go <laughs> so and curiously you know it's not the same person for everyone for some person i feel i feel relief when they go away but for somebody else when they come they welcome them so it it's not necessarily their fault or my fault it's just that sometimes some some people's chemistry doesn't match so now if we have to work with some devotee with whom we are not able to get along so well then we see that as an opportunity to do two services 
one is doing the service and second is doing that service with that person it's, it's krishna knows that it is what we are going through in the in the bhagavatam and then can to describe that and krishna got one uh, parijat flower for rukmini and after satyabhama got annoyed and she demanded so he got a whole tree for her and then after that when krishna went to rukmini he thought what is it rukmini will ask something from me rukmini will be upset but rukmini was not rukmini did not show anything at all and later on krishna told by this you pleased me so much so krishna knew what rukmini was going through and krishna appreciated that still she maintained her service attitude towards him. so the so the point i'm making is that if we are not able to get along with some devotee then krishna knows that and if still we are trying to work with the devotee krishna will appreciate that so in in some cases you know, serving with some devotee is also a service <laughs> <laughs> so it's difficult to do that service but that's why krishna krishna sees that and krishna appreciates that so we were if there is difficulty in working with some devotee and still be work with that devotee then we make spiritual advancement through that because we are curbing our natural impulses and we are trying to maintain a devotional disposition krishna will see that so it's not that uh, krishna is uh, unaware of the difficulties we are going through so sometimes we serve with some people sometimes we serve through some people that means they are like our representative spiritual masters sometimes we serve some people just do it for them and sometimes we serve in spite of some people so there are different uh, permutations that may work in general if it is uh, difficult to work with some person then it is and it is not possible say to avoid working with them so then it is good to have some well defined boundaries generally ha uh, i said that good fences create good neighbors that means if there's a quarrel between two neighbors this this fruit came in my yard this fruit came in my yard there's no fence they'll keep fighting so if we create some well defined expectations you know okay this is what i am expected to do this is what you are expected to do. then there will not be constant uh, to and fro because what happens when there is tension between two people then even a small uh, problem can lead to an explosion and to minimize that if if at a time when both of us are relatively calm or both of us are with somebody who is senior and is trustworthy we plan out and this is how we are going to work and when there are well defined expectations then the chances of uh, uh, chances of provocation and explosion become much lesser also uh, when we work this way with uh, relatively well defined expectations then uh, gradually by working like that we can eventually even learn um, to appreciate the good side of devotee the devotee initially i have this problem but then i see when i work with someone okay, this, this is good about this person it's good about this person sometimes uh, some relationships keep us in our comfort zone because i like this i like the devotee that devotee likes me and it's good but sometimes we may, we may not we may not develop much vaishnava qualities in that we may we may not also sometimes some people sometimes some people leaders by the hand towards krishna some people make us run towards krishna <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so so different people if we see that they are a part of krishna's plan to help us become more dependent on him more connected with him then we can appreciate even the way they are acting but in general if we know that there is some some people or some interactions where there is some volatility there is some tension there is like little bit tension it's best to clarify expectations you know in the mahabharata described that when the five pandavas got married to draupadi when they came back home narad muni came to meet them narad muni is a sage they came to meet them the whole meeting is you know how are all five of you going to associate with draupadi 
and they made a plan over there. This is this, this, this. And then when, when Arjuna did not act according to that plan, one time he went to the forest for one year. They took it very seriously. So there, although they were very good, they were they were not just brothers, but they were best of friends. But there was a situation where some volatility was there. They made a plan how to deal with it. And so in general, where volatile situations are likely, it's it's vital to have some clarification, clarified expectations, specified and clarified expectations. Then that decreases the chance of um, chance of unnecessary misunderstandings or confrontations. But in general, these are opportunities where we can make spiritual advancement much more. Although it may be a little bit of tension, but uh, we can make spiritual advancement through that also. Okay. Okay. So, yes. Well, sometimes our our japa it falls a little late. We can't finish in the morning. So we have to finish a little bit late. But then once we once we get here, then more services come up. By chanting, we're asking for more the more uh, give us um, more service. Krishna can give us some more desire to do a service. So is it better? So should we not do the service and focus on our japa, or should we do the service and then do the japa at the time? Okay, if we're not able to chant in the morning, and then later on either we can chant or we have to some service to do. So should we do the service because we are praying to the Krishna to give us service only through chanting, or should we focus on chanting? There's no absolute over here. In general, uh, we have to see the time, place, circumstances, and we have to decide accordingly. If some services can be done later, we do them later and do our japa. Sometimes some services have to be done at that time. That's fine. So sometimes Prabhupada would say Krishna consciousness. Sometimes some devotees would ask too many things. Should we do this? Should we do that? Like when they are caring for Tulsi, uh, first time they brought it to America, Tulsi to America, and they are trying to care for Tulsi. They would ask a long list of questions. Should we do this? Should we do this? Should we do this? So Prabhupada answered several of the questions. And then for last, the remaining question is, use your intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so, what that means is that ultimately, we can't predict any and every kind of situation that we are going to find. So, if we understand broad principle, Japa is a very important way in which you want to connect with Krishna. And the earlier we do it is better. Because the more we are in it's better. But sometimes, other things come up. And sometimes uh, we may also feel that, okay, in the heat of this movement, I have 10 minutes, I can chant two rounds. But then my, my mind is constantly caught in the next thing, next thing which I will do. Then if I have time in the evening, I may decide, in the evening I'll chant peacefully. But then we go in the evening and we we'll find out oh, something, this came up, that came up, that came up, and then late night I'm chanting. Then I may decide that, you know, okay, this putting off in the evening, it doesn't work so well. So we have to learn from our own experience how we can best serve Krishna. Best in terms of offering our consciousness during chanting to Krishna and, and also best in terms of how we can do uh, integrate chanting into a life of service. So there's no no need to absolutize this kind of things. Some devotees may say that during chanting I'll not talk. I'll complete this round and I'll talk with you. So that's what they feel inspired to do, that's okay. But that doesn't have to be, that doesn't mean that somebody who talks during chanting is less serious about the chanting. You see, they, they may think that Okay, this devotee has come to talk with me. Why should I keep this devotee meeting? Then I have a service attitude about that. So in bhakti, there are principles and there are preferences. So uh, if we make preferences into principles, we become fanatic. That means what? What is a preference? Some devotees may prefer to sit and chant. Some devotees may sit to stand and chant. Some devotees may sit prefer to walk and chant. Now, is it that? Uh, those who are walking and chanting are less serious and those who are sitting and chanting are more serious. Could be, but need not be. Ultimately, it's the amount of attention. Generally, we could say that sitting and chanting is likely to be more attentive. But sometimes, we may be sitting and we may be sleeping. Or we may be sitting and still, we may be just looking who all is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so, how I chant, whether I Chant, walk and chant, or sit and chant, or stand and chant, that's a preference. Chanting is the principle. So similarly, if I am, if in the day, course of the day I have some service to do, and I'm chanting too, 
some devotee said, first complete your chanting. That's a wow. That's what you want to think. That's most important. Okay, fine. You said, no, the service is going to be after chanting. That's a preference. So I think what our preferences will be, uh, that will vary from person to person and also from time, place, circumstances. So no need to absolutize that. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bro. Okay. Go ahead. So, sometimes um, on the pictures they draw soul as a kind of loose part, and sometimes they um, draw the soul have form. So, what is this? Good question. So sometimes in the pictures they show soul as a as a something like a blue spark or a spark of white light. Sometimes they show it as, as having a form. Yes, the soul. One of the characters Krishna says is avyaktoyam uh, achintyoyam avikaryoyam uchite is unmanifest, is inconceivable, is unchangeable. So achintyoyam means that the soul's form, soul's whatever form, what form you want, soul's form or soul's uh, uh, okay soul's form only it is not manifest to us and it is not conceivable by us so what what the soul is that itself is not manifest or conceivable to us the only way we conceive it is through its symptom of consciousness mm -hmm. so for the purpose of depiction at particular uh, sometimes the soul may be, the soul at present is a spark of consciousness mm -hmm. so in that sense the soul is depicted as a spark of effulgent light mm -hmm. But in some situations, say for example, in the case of Ajamil, if you see that picture, it's shown that the Yamudutas are coming and they're catching Ajamil's, mm, they're catching Ajamil and taking him out. So, in that sense, maybe there's Ajamil's body and there's another form which is similar over there. Yeah, so that there, what is being depicted is the subtle body, not the soul. So, now in some cases, when the Soul is depicted as having a particular form. You have to see the context. If it's a pure devotee who has awakened their swarupa, then that swarupa might be depicted over there. But in general, uh, to depict the soul as having a particular form right now, that would be a little problematic. Sometimes, just to illustrate the point that the soul is not just an impersonal spark of consciousness, but soul is a person. For that purpose, the soul may be depicted as a particular form. So. In general, this whole uh, what, do you, what do you call it? <coughs> chitra, chitra picture as a means of conveying tattwa. That is, uh, it is, it is not possible to chitra to, to pictures to give exact philosophical truth. Because philosophical truths are often beyond simple depictions. But they are used to give certain indications. So we have to see the context and then understand what was indicated through there. Okay? Yes, sir. So, from this question is on uh, forgiveness. So, I know the two matters is kind of related to that. Like, uh, two years back, when he came, I think he mentioned judgment, judging without understanding. Yeah. He also mentioned about the cooperation. Like, co it's not cooperation, it is cooperation. So, the question is, uh, oftentimes we end up in you know, a relationship uh, so you can, uh, we have issues and the damage has already been happened. So, we have a tendency, like, I mean, if we are in this article stage, we can put a fence and you know, maybe not associate with the neighbor. Okay. But uh, as you grow in leader, as, as a leader, how do you actually, you know, really, do you really forgive or do you act like as you? Forgive or just like the tap goes on, and then all the bad things just mm. comes on the monitor. Okay. So if somebody has hurt, somebody has done something just hurt us, and then we want to keep the relationship good, but those past hurts keep coming up. So do we forgive, or what do we do? How do we continue at that time? There are three different things. There is forgiving. There is forgetting and there is trusting. Okay. So forgiveness is for the past. And that should always be given. But trusting is for the future. And trust has to be earned. If we are given some money to someone and they lost the money. Okay. 
I may forgive that. But if I again give money to them, I will be being foolish. So trust, sometimes we feel forgive, we equate forgiving and trusting as the same thing. And then we say, how can I forgive? But no, forgiving is for the past. What wrongs happened? Okay. Then let us close the chapter. But trust has by trust has to be earned. And unless uh, that trust is earned, just uh, if we conflate forgiving and trusting, then we may be taken for a ride. The person may just keep doing the same thing again and again and again. And we will be fooled by that. So broadly speaking, we can talk about forgiveness in two terms. Forgiveness in terms of our emotions and forgiveness in terms of our actions. So in terms of our emotions, we don't hold a resentful or a vengeful attitude towards anyone. We understand whatever they did, it was because of their condition. If I suffered because of that, that was because of my past karma. And I don't I don't keep that replaying again and again in my mind. Should this happen? Let's close this chapter. <laughs> so forgiveness enables us to basically forgiveness. <coughs> whenever somebody does some wrong, our mind basically keeps replaying it. Did this, did this, did this, did this. This keeps happening again and again. But when you forgive, forgiveness basically is a way to power off the mind's auto replay of that past hurt. But when I forgive, it's okay. It's a, it's a decision I make. I won't hold this again and again. Still, the replay may go on, but if we don't invest our emotion in it, if I am not resentful, if I am not vengeful, then that replace power is going down. So, in terms of intention, we forgive. Now, in terms of action, we have to uh, see practically. Because, in general, uh, there is a principle of forgiveness and there is a principle of justice. And if we see Krishna, when he went to Duryodhana as Shanti Dut, although the Kauravas had done grievous wrongs, Krishna was ready to end it all. So just give five villages. But they refused to accept even that. Yeah, in fact, they tried to arrest Krishna. That means they were not only not ready to uh, uh, ready to compromise, arrive at a mutual self element actually continuing their past mentality. Then their forgiveness would have been stupid. So Krishna fought. Now, the Pandavas did not fight to take revenge. They fought for justice. They fought for establishing that. So generally, when punishment is given hmm, for uh, some disciplinary action is taken against someone, that has three broad purposes. One is to teach that person a lesson that actions have consequences and for them to register the gravity <coughs> of the wrong that they did. Mm -hmm. Second is to set an example for others that you know, if we do, do this wrong, mm -hmm. this will be the result. And third is to acknowledge the, the pain that the victim has gone through. Mm -hmm. to, uh, so now that pain cannot be compensated by causing pain to another person. But still, the principle of justice means if you have caused pain, you have to get pain. So uh, now, in our sense, if we forgive this third part, that you cause me pain, so I'll cause you pain. That we may not want that. But still, the second and the, the first and the second apply. If that person is not taught a lesson, then they may do the same thing again, they may do it worse. And not only that, others may do it also by seeing their example. So in that sense, forgiveness is a, okay, this is a, actually I have a whole seminar on forgiveness, which I'm not going to, but forgiveness at an individual <coughs> level is a Brahminical principle. But Kshatriyas who are administrators, they cannot operate on the principle of forgiveness alone. Kshatriyas also have to operate on the principle of justice. Chatriyas may also forgive sometimes, but the driving principle of a Brahmana is forgiveness. Whatever you do, I'll forgive. Um, of course, Chatriya, Brahmana sometimes get angry and they give curses, but that is unbrahmanical behavior. <laughs> <laughs> In general, Brahmanas are expected to forgive. That is their quality. Shama is the quality of Brahmanas. But Chatriyas, they are administrators. They have to maintain order in society. 
So their normal operating principle is justice. They may also forgive on occasions, but uh, Kshatriyas are more like judges. <coughs> judges, they have to evaluate the magnitude of the crime and give an appropriate punishment. And if the, if the criminal is very repentant, if the criminal is behaving well, then they may minimize it also. But judges don't operate on the principle of forgiveness. They operate on the principle of seeking justice. So now, when we work in the devotee community, at that time, say forgiveness is something which we we would like to practice. Because ultimately we are all sadhakas, we all struggle, we all make mistakes. So forgiveness is what we would like to operate on. But at the same time, we are not just isolated sadhakas. We are sadhakas living in a community. And each person's actions, uh, they have consequences. So, you know, once uh, I'm one of the editors for BTG. So there was one person, one boy who was in jail and there he met devotees and he became a devotee. It's quite a tra dramatic transformation of life here. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we decided to publish an article about his. It was, a, it was an article about jail preaching, and then he had become a devotee over there. <laughs> How through jail preaching he became a devotee. But then just before we published the article, at that time we got a letter from some other devotee in that community, and apparently this boy had gone to a jail because he had molested a devotee girl before. Now, can we portray him as an ideal devotee or any kind of devotee transfer? It's a serious question. So then we just deferred the decision to that community. Because in this case, he has been transformed. But you know, we are living in a community. If it is simply a story of his transformation, that's a, that's a testimony of Bhakti. But there's a community over there and there are other people's emotions involved over there. And if you highlight this person, it may hurt those who have been the victims of the past crime. So we, ha we have to balance over there. That's why uh, when we are living in a community, there has to be both the Brahminical principle of forgiveness at an individual level, but there also has to be Satriya principle of justice at a managerial level. And how to balance this, this has to be seen according to time, place, circumstance. And uh, in general, as I said, uh, trust will have to be earned. So maybe sometimes some, uh, once a person commits a mistake, we may decide to forgive. But then we can't just give the trust. They will have to act in a trustworthy way by which they can earn the trust. Sometimes even one mistake may be so grave that it has consequences on others and within the community we may have to take some action over this. But in general, uh, if it is a devotee who is overall serious in the spiritual life, then we don't have to hold the past against them. So, but by interacting with them, if we see that they are, they are behaving in a responsible way, they are trusting, then we can move forwards and then the trust can be earned. And as far as forgetting is concerned, it's quite difficult. Again, if we equate forgiving with forgetting, then say, how can I forget? As soon as I see this person, even when I don't see the person, the replay is going on in my mind. <laughs> then if I see the person, how can the replay not go on? It's true, it will go on. It's like a uh, scar. If I was injured, I got a scar on my hand. Now the scar, I can't wish it away. The scar is there. But if it is a raw wound and I scratch it, it will keep worsening. But if I let it be, it will heal. And once it heals, the scar is still there. But just touching it or thinking of it won't hurt me. Because the wound has got filled and healed. Similarly, uh, uh, when the wound is raw, somebody has done something wrong, at that time, every thought of itself will agitate us. Hmm? But when we forgive, that means we decide, okay, this was my past karma, this person was just an instrument, and Krishna had some plan, so I won't hold this against this person. I won't seek revenge, I won't seek, uh, I won't resent. We accept that. Then that acceptance is what allows the wound to be. And then after that also, when we see that person, we may remember. Oh, they did like this. But that's like, just a, it's a memory which has been divested of its emotional power because we have allowed it to heal. We'll remember, but not in a emotionally agitating way. Okay, that an event happened in my life, it's a long time ago. Or it happened in my life, it's okay. So we, we can forgive in terms of intention, not hold it against them, not resent or not seek revenge. In terms of action, 
how what we have to do that we have to see upon time place circumstance and generally we have to think of uh, not just our emotions but we also think about that person's well being if they keep repeating it or that person what example they are setting for others so with respect to justice we have to think of all these factors and then arrive at a proper decision see okay. so oh this okay so till how much time can we go on or maybe <laughs> i i it's 9:15 but finally go on so it is <laughs> so it is misleadingly <coughs> favorable eh? <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's okay. So, That's good. Yes, so how many have left? One, two, three, four. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, four. <minutes. laughs> you keep a time. Okay. Tell me when four minutes are over. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You had a question. Yes. Yeah, so had a question. Um. So this was maybe an extension about this question of forgiveness. So there's. One situation. Um, so you mentioned that the Brahminical principle is the Brahmins are always the general principle is to forgive. Yet um, there's one situation which is that, and of course, a Vaishnav doesn't ever consider that they themselves have been offended. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they don't even think that they can be offended. They don't even think that there's somebody to be offended. offended. But it says that um, one is not supposed to forgive. An offense to somebody else. Um, in fact, in the Nectar of Devotion, it says that um, one should, if one witnesses a Vaishnava then one has what can I yeah, do? Um, I get vehemently it. protest or commit suicide or leave. So usually we don't try to commit suicide. But those are the three options. On the other hand, if one takes this principle too far, then one can just you know be seeing Vaishnava Prad everywhere and imagining it, and it, it could cause a lot of problems. But on the yeah. other hand, we don't have the right to forgive a Vaishnava Prabhu against someone else. Vaishnava will not forgive a Prabhu. Okay. He says only that that Vaishnava can forgive. Okay, yeah. So then how? how yeah. Um, so generally, we say that a Vaishnava Prabhu cannot be forgiven. We should vehemently oppose mm -hmm. it at least, or walk away from it. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't forgive it. So what do we do? <coughs> in general, no principle in Bhakti. He should be absolutized. The absolute principle is that Krishna is our Lord; we are His servants, and everything else is meant to assist us in that. Sarva vidhi nishedasu etayoro hinkaram smarta ve satadam vishnu smarta ve najatut. All rules that purpose is to remember Krishna. So, now if we consider the Daksha Lila, the fourth canto of the Bhagavatam, where Daksha was dis uh, Daksha disrespected Shiva. He did not uh, have a place for him and the offerings for him. And then he neglected Parvati also. And seeing this disrespect of Shiva, the uh, servants of Shiva got angry and they cursed. And then the Brahmanas counter cursed. And the whole thing became a disaster. So at this point, you know, where did things go wrong? Where could things have been stopped? And Shiva was disrespected. We could say that it was his. His followers, it was their duty to protect the honor. Yes, so we say, yes, it is the duty of their to protect the honor of their spiritual master. Of their, uh, but at the same time, you know, we have to act in a way that makes things better, not act in a way that makes things worse. So we have to act in a way that we can remember Krishna and we can help others to remember Krishna. If the confrontation becomes just too aggravated and ugly, then nobody's remembering Krishna. Either. So, it is also the principle. On one side, we say that we shouldn't forgive an offense to devotees, but there's also Chaitanya Bhagavat says that if there are two Vaishnavas who are in conflict, don't take sides in it. It says yes. four times almost. The same yeah, same state, you know. So especially that two advanced devotees have differences. Mm -hmm. Now, again, is that an absolute principle? One devotee might be operating on a partial understanding and then we're criticizing some other devotee. Mm -hmm. Then, we, if we are in a position, we may have to clarify. So, I would say these principles. They are important. They indicate the gravity of the situation. That you don't get caught in sectarian battles with devotees. Don't take criticism of a devotee lightly. But the literal enactment of that, that the, rather than taking that as a literal principle which you have to enact every time, we see that these are indicative of how grave they are. And what specifically we do, we see that based on the broad principles of Krishna Bhakti, 
of what is anukul for our bhakti what is anukul for others bhakti oh yes nowadays with the internet available you know we can anybody can just criticize anyone just press one email and it can go to hundred thousands of people so what can we do at that time so we have to see what is anukul for our bhakti and what is anukul for others bhakti so with respect to forgiving uh, uh, or not forgiving offenses to others we have to see what is our service what is our seva is it say for example if i am a, am i in a position of being a protector of that devotee do i have that adhikar if i don't have that adhikar then it is becoming something like a self appointed service then it can it can unnecessarily lead to complications so if if we can clarify generally speaking the when when there is criticism there are three broad things we can do one is talk with that devotee directly and try to address that second is we talk with others who are affected if that devotee is not ready to understand you know talk with others who are affected and help them get a proper understanding or third is just think about it the three broad options so now which option is best for our service to krishna we'll have to see sometimes some devotees are completely fixed about their opinions oh, they just not going to change so talking with them is of no use and sometimes uh, we may say okay let me talk with the others because they are affected by it or sometimes it may be that the by talking about some criticism we give it more attention and in uh, one of my services was communications so they say that if some some we get some negative press if somebody criticizes us in newspapers if we try to refute that sometimes that refutation increases attention also so let's be direct it is very careful what we do at that time so there is no one 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 simple principle that we can apply at all times using our god given intelligence we have to find out what will help best to resolve this issue what will help to minimize the tension whether it will be confront confronting that devotee itself whether it will be clarifying others or whether we just be neglecting and moving on with life in most situations in today's world it is just moving on with life that's what is required okay thank you yes who was the next ram we are having a support hand so the kita you mentioned you mentioned that um, if we are not um, in devotional mood and we can get to spiritual world then uh, what what we we get going to be out of place and there is instances instances of special mercy of krishna like you know, for example putting us more into spiritual world and i heard i guess also in the spiritual world because he had the affection for his mm. sister putting yeah and so what okay, happens yeah. then so if we say putana and agasur how did they go to the spiritual world when they did not have devotion actually well they did not have devotion but they had some devotional action or devotional intention some putana she offered her milk to krishna it was malevolently but the act itself was like a nurse agasur he offered his body as a playground to krishna's friends so krishna saw that you know in the vishnu sahasra naam it is said that the two names of vishnu guru guru tamo dhama nimisho animisho nimisho swagri vachas atirudaradhi so nimisho means one who blinks his eyes animisho means one who never blinks his eyes so the two contradictory names so baldev vidya bhushan written the commentary on the on the vishnu sahasra naam and there he says that what does it mean he says when a devotee is try to sincerely serve krishna the devotee commits a mistake and krishna blinks his eyes <laughs> <laughs> and overlooks the mistake and on the other hand if a devotee does even a small service to krishna krishna unblinkingly notes that service and rewards that service so in this case krishna noted the small incidental service that putana and agasur did that's how they attained krishna the lord yes sir yeah four more minutes that's <clears throat> Following, uh, once on the uh, 
So it's so much to hear. Now, how do we stay focused and not get just overloaded? See, broadly, there are two aspects. One is that if there's something interesting, something stimulating, you would like to read that. And sometimes you may actually find something more stimulating also. But at the same time, the other is that the mind is by nature restless. And if you just keep, okay, let me find some new, someone new, someone new to hear, someone new to hear, then we will never hear in a sustained way. So I would say that if whatever time we have, we decide, say, okay, I have, I have three hours, five hours in a week, 10 hours in a week, whatever it is, some part of a time, we focus for systematic study. Mm -hmm. So it may be one book, I take and read that book. Or one devotee, I take and not just hear different classes. Or if I want to develop a relationship with that Vaishnava, a spiritual master and a spiritual mentor, I may hear them. Or it's better that I take one, if they've spoken one topic, I take that and hear that. In Bhagavad Gita, they've spoken systematically. Or they've spoken some other book. So some time of our hearing or reading, we keep for systematic reading. And sometime we can keep for inspiration. So now exact percentage we can vary based on time, place, circumstance. Sometimes we may find that in the inspirational, we may find something which is very, very good, and then we may make that systematic in future. That's okay. But if we just if all our hearing is only inspirational, then what happens is sometimes we may not get inspiration also, and we just go at the level of the mind. We hear this like say, yeah, this is boring. Let me go to someone else. Let me go to someone else. Then we don't connect with Krishna. So we have to have a service attitude where the purpose of hearing is not just to get uh, intellectual stimulation or even intellectual comprehension. The purpose of hearing or reading is also to serve Krishna with our intelligence. So we of course want understanding and we will get understanding also. But at one level, uh, it's just we are serving Krishna with our intelligence. The Bhagavad Gita Krishna say is in 18.70 that those who uh, study this conversation of ours, they are worshipping me with their intelligence. So like we do puja with a, a lamp, we can do puja with a, our intelligence also. So we want to have that service attitude. And that's why some systematic hearing, even if it doesn't seem to be so stimulating, we can decide a finite time. Okay, I want to read the Bhagavatam first canto. So then in the next, if I read every day 10 pages, in the next three months, I'll complete the canto. So then I, I may not be able to read exactly 10 pages every day. Some days I may reach 20, some days I may not be able to read anything, but at least I have that direction. That is my systematic study. And along with that, I have some time for inspirational, inspirational reading, inspirational hearing also. That way you can balance both. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. So I've been hearing to So one of the lectures he was mentioning about the literal world. So, and then, there is a big context in the discourse I was hearing that. So, actually, like, uh, we have dreams. We know it's not true. And then, we get up, we know it's not true in the dream. But, but the, again, I give, uh, in the material, they are seeing something happening. Right? So, why do I, so if that is not true, this also will not be true. Why do you think this is true, but that is not true? Mm -hmm. So this and actually, and uh, I further follow up, and actually, Dr. Sila Prabhupada also in one of his room, which is, he has spoken about this. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada comes up with a point like, uh, so that's okay, this is not true. But the thing is, this opportunity to serve Krishna, mm -hmm. that you will get only this, uh, this yeah. to do this step. Mm -hmm. So other things may not be true, but the opportunity, that is true. Yeah. So that's something we should not do. I wanted your opinion because again, this the way the whole thing explanation is like it goes all the way from the Maya that you are speaking okay. So, so, okay. okay. So is the material world real? Is it like if it is like a dream, then isn't it unreal? Or how do we exactly see it? Actually, Baldevidya Bhushan in his Govinda Bhashya commented in Vedan Sutra turns this whole thing around. And he says, because our waking state is like the dream state, therefore even dreams are real. <laughs> and he gives reasons. He says, why are dreams real? He says, that sometimes in the dreams, the Lord also appears. So the supreme reality is appearing. How can the dream be illusion? 
and then he also says that in dreams some different people have different kinds of dreams in our in some of our dreams we are just spectators in some of our dreams we are participants but in none of our dreams we are the controllers and sometimes we say it was like a dream but actually even in a dream everything doesn't happen according to our will <laughs> you know <laughs> so he says and why do different people get different dreams some people i knew i knew one devotee is afraid of sleeping because as soon as he sleeps he gets nightmares you know some people get bad dreams and some people wish each other happy dreams it's not the sentiment you know people who get bad dreams it's it's a problem so he explains over there that the the same ishwara who is the controller of the waking world is also the controller of the dreaming world and that ishwara uses the dream world to give us reactions to our minor karmas so if i get nightmares you know that is a reaction to my own karma some people get good dreams some people get dreams they don't even remember it so it doesn't matter some people get bad dreams that's a reaction to karma just as we get bad situations in waking life similarly we get bad situations in uh, dreaming in the dream also so that's so in that sense he says even the dreams are real what to so uh, now this world is also real waking waking level is also real dream level is also real now now this is from a philosophical perspective uh, now from another perspective we can say that it's all unreal in what sense in the sense that it's all temporary prabhupad explains reality in i think in science of self realization in his essay says reality means that which is not vanquished by time that is the definition of reality he uses and he i think quotes nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sata 2.16 he says that bhavita is that of the eternal there is no cessation and of the temporary there is no endurance so in that sense because this world is temporary so in that sense it is unreal uh, now the the vaishnava mayavadi understanding is very different from the vaishnava understanding even when we say this world is unreal what we mean it is temporary the things here don't have <laughs> any enduring reality but right now uh, our actions have real consequences and also it is our actions here that will take us to reality it is only when we become purified by the practice of bhakti sadhana bhakti in this world that it will rise to supreme reality so he says the difference between the sapna and the jagruti state is that in sapna we can use in jagruti we can use our swechha to do sadhana in sapna we can't do that in sapna also we may see krishna but that's krishna's mercy we are not doing any sadhana over there so we get we get conscientious by our efforts we get purified in the waking state in the mayavadi understanding when they say this world is illusion their idea is that not only is the world illusion they say we also are illusion so basically right right now when i am looking at you so if i i am the subject of consciousness you are the object of consciousness and in between is the stream of consciousness so our understanding is that what is the illusion if i think that you know you are meant for my enjoyment or the world is meant for the object of consciousness is meant for my enjoyment then that is illusion the object is real the subject is also real the stream of consciousness is also real what is unreal is the conception that the object is meant for the subject's enjoyment rather the, both the object and the subject are meant for krishna's service so the bhagavatam defines maya as rite artham yat pratyete na pratyet chatman tad vidya atmano maya yatha vasu yatha tama when we see anything disconnected from the lord that is maya so the object is not maya it is our seeing it disconnected from the lord that is maya so to, for the subject to see the object as a source of enjoyment that is maya but the mayavadi idea is that both the subject and the object are illusion only the stream of consciousness is the reality so our understanding is pure consciousness means consciousness that sees everything connected with krishna their understanding is pure consciousness means there is only consciousness there is no subject no object but that raises the question if you get liberated who gets liberated because the person who gets liberated itself is dissolved the subject is not there so there is no one to there is no one to actually enjoy liberation so <laughs> sorry yeah that's a fundamental question obviously 
where, where if there's non-differentiated consciousness alone existing, then where did the subject object duality come from at all? So the, the, the philosophy has a lot of problems, but suffice it to say, for our understanding, uh, if we start taking this world too seriously, thinking that I will I will enjoy in this world, in that context, you say it's temporary. Don't take it so seriously. It's illusion. But it's illusion in the sense that it has it has pursuing it independently of the ultimate reality is going to keep us in illusion. But it is not illusion in the sense that it doesn't exist. It is illusion only in the sense that getting obsessed with it will keep us in illusion. But if you see it in connection with the supreme reality, then this world is the way we can go towards the supreme reality. In fact, bhakti redefines, the senses are normally seen as a pathways to bondage. Uh, but bhakti redefines the senses as pathways to liberation. Now our eyes can bind us. The devotee's prayer is that, not that I don't want to see anything. I want to see the Lord's form. Our tongue, we can do gossip and bind us. But our tongue, glorifying Krishna, we can get purified. So bhakti is in that sense, it uses this world to go attain reality. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakta Vinda Ki. If you are interested, please let me know. You are welcome to OAC tomorrow. The question answer session will also continue. Tomorrow's topic is very nice. Parishit, what is the topic tomorrow? Parishit.